Okay. I'd like to call to order the May 27th, 2014 special meeting of the Board of Adjustment of South Orange Village. Uh, read first, adequate notice of this meeting has been provided to the public by posting on the bulletin board in Village Hall, the Village's website, and the South Orange Maplewood News Record, and by filing said notice in the office of the Village Clerk. Do we have a roll call? Yes, Mr. Don. Here. Mr. Descalo. Here. Mr. Parlapiano. Here. Mr. Semper. Here. Mr. Adler. Here. Ms. Waring. Here. And Ms. Sabrine. Here. We're getting some feedback up here. Okay. Okay. Uh, the application that we're hearing tonight at this special hearing is case 1011. South Orange Dental Center, PA, Block 903, Lot 19, 481 South Orange Avenue. They're requesting C and D variance relief. The applicant is seeking to expand the existing structure. I'd like to just qualify that. They're not seeking to physically expand the existing structure. They're seeking to, they're seeking to expand the portion of the structure that's being used for professional, uh, for dental offices. So there's no change in the structure. It's just the use of the interior of the structure. <coughs> We're still getting a big hum up here. Okay. Um, Mr. Freeland, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think you alluded to the fact that uh, there was a slight error in the uh, description of um, what we're trying to do here tonight on the agenda. Well, I just wanted to make it clear that, there, <clears throat> that somebody wasn't confused that there was an addition plan. You, you cleared it up, thank you. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank, as well as my client, each of you for giving up your time on this additional uh, <clears throat> special meeting. Uh, Dr. Rosemont appreciates it. As indicated by Mr. Don, we're not seeking to expand the existing structure. There will be no changes whatsoever to the exterior. We'll retain the existing footprint of the building and the only changes will be inside the interior of the structure. Uh, with respect to the exterior, the only thing we're really gonna do is to make it look better. We're gonna spruce up, paint, refresh, front porch and landscape if necessary. Uh, I trust that the board has received copies of the February the 20, third and June 21st, 1976, certified resolutions of the previous board. You have that? Yeah, I believe so. I have, I have copies. Yes. <clears throat> Briefly, we, we seek a use variance, 40 colon 55-7D. Offices are not permitted in the RA zone 60. Only professional offices in a home are allowed. There's also several C variances, parking, setbacks, lot coverage. Uh, we have two witnesses. The applicant, Dr. Rosemond, who I must indicate has taken some 80 hours of um, classes in office design, I believe at NYU and he will testify as to the explanation of the architectural plans. And uh, then we have Rich Richard Keller, a prominent uh, professional planner engineer whom all of you know very well. Uh, he'll provide us with the design and planning testimony on all issues. Uh, I would like the board's permission, uh, council, if I could call both witnesses <clears throat> at the same time, 
and qualify them uh, at the beginning if you allow me to do that. Because they're going to be interrupting each did other. Did I understand correctly, Mr. Friedland, that the, the gentleman who drafted the architectural plan submitted is not here? He is not here, no. He will not be testifying. He will not be here. Um, the problem with having both of them sworn and, and talking at the same time is it's difficult to keep track of who said what. So is it possible we can swear them both at the beginning, but I'd like to hear from one of them at a time if we could. And if there's a question to be posed to either, we can handle that as it goes. That, that would be good. So if, if we may do that, I, and I will keep them separate. Okay. Dr. Rosemond will testify as to the incredible cramped area of his existing office. His waiting area is too cramped. The employees basically fall on top of each other. And there are really, he, he is in desperate need to expand his, his office. And he's been in business now for 19 years at this location. Uh, I believe that you received the uh, approval from the Historic Preservation Committee of our appearance there, I believe it was sometime in April. Uh, and it appears to me that the committee approved the non-binding advice and has so notified the board of adjustment of, uh, of, of their approval. Now, I have here, I prepared a long history of the property. I'm not gonna testify. I'm gonna have my client testify as to his particular understanding and personal knowledge of this property that has been a professional dental office for some 60 years. Uh, I'll just conclude by indicating that this building will retain its entire residential character facing Elm Court. The ingress and egress for the professional office will remain solely on South Orange Avenue. And the entire existing structure will be renovated and painted, spruced up so it will look as well as it should within the confines of the uh, <clears throat> Montrose Historical S Society. Um, Elm Court remains totally unchanged except a little bit of refreshing up front. Dr. Rosemond? Bill? Mr. Adler? Yeah, um, Mr. Friedland made reference to the resolutions okay, that we got uh, last week. Uh, I just want to know when you think is a good time to discuss what they mean. Mr. Well, are we going to ask him to I, try to I, I didn't hear that. To answer that question, Mr. Adler? I think that's a good question. You can ask it any time. Okay. Mr. Adler was asking about the, um, the two resolutions that we received from back in uh, 1976. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. Adler has some questions that he wanted to ask about those. So we were wondering when would be the time. Who should we direct those questions well, to? Well, I, I think probably, since I can't testify, they should be addressed to, uh, <clears throat> to Mr. Keller. And if there's something that he isn't aware of or it needs further <clears throat> explanation, I'll be happy to, to venture my understanding of the facts involved. <clears throat> do you want to do that now? I don't, you, I don't, I don't, I personally don't care if, if we get counsel's understanding of what they are. Um, it's okay with you. It's fine. You, I mean, you, not testifying, it's just talking about law. I why guess. don't we deal with it now then? <coughs> okay. Well, why don't we swear okay. to <clears throat> so I'll answer any talk. questions you have. Let's swear in the well, Why don't we swear in and then we'll go from there. <coughs> what was that? Well, why don't we swear in and we'll go from there. Were you sworn in? <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Do you want to swear them both in at the same time, or do you want yeah, to? Yes, we should. Okay. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you'll give here this evening is the whole truth? Yes. Pl yes I do. Please state your name and address for the record. And speak okay. into the microphone, please, so we don't get yelled at. Dr. Hanuel Roseman, 18 Beverly Road, West Orange, New Jersey. Richard Keller, my professional address is 258 Main Street in Milburn. I'm a licensed professional engineer and planner. Do you want to qualify, Mr. Keller, at this point? Uh, Dr. Rosemond, would you, you give me? us a brief well, description? Uh, Mr. Friedman, Friedman, just for the record, we will recognize Mr. Keller as an expert in site engineering and planning. Thank you. We don't need to hear his <coughs> credentials Thank you. yet again. Thank you. <coughs> You went, to, <clears throat> you went to Howard University? Yes, I did. And did you get your dental degree in 1995? 1985. 1985. That's please, make, said, please make sure you're speaking right into that microphone. Not so much for us, but for the for the. I record. understand. For all the people watching at home. <laughs> <clears throat> if you could tell this board what you know about the history of the property in question. Okay. I have a little, little statement that I put together that may um, address some of the questions that the board may have. First of all, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate you coming out this evening in, in this special particular meeting. Thank you so much. My name is Dr. Hanuel Roseman. I present before you today regarding the property located at 481 South Orange Avenue, South Orange, New Jersey. This has been the location of my dental practice for the last 19 years without interruption. I purchased the property from Dr. Ronald Nagelberg in 1995. And the, I purchased the practice from Dr. Nagelberg in 1995 and the property from the estate of the late Dr. Fish, the original dentist at the location in 2001. This location has been used exclusively as a dental practice for the last 60 years without interruption. I now seek to utilize the entire front area facing Elm Court to better serve my patients. The additional space will allow us to, one, provide improved privacy for our patients during treatment and consultation as per current, current government privacy laws, two, provide adequate space for utilization of current dental technologies such as our lasers, cab cat units, and panoramic x-ray technologies, three, provide additional space to expand our sterilization, storage, and computer areas. Four, create a space with a more efficient workflow. The above changes are to be in compliance with current and or future anticipated standards relating to dental practice. Please note that this entire presentation is predominantly interior expansion and renovation. The exterior portion of this project is repair and painting of the exterior. There will be no changes to the existing residential character facing Elm Court. The ingress and egress of the office will remain solely on South Orange Avenue. The overall premise of this project is to maintain and exceed the compliance of my practice with today's standard of dental care while maintaining the historic appearance and with no intent of <coughs> disturbing the historic district in any way. As a part of this community for the last 19 years, I have a true appreciation and respect for the village and the historic district. Given the above facts, I would respectfully request this honorable board approve and endorse the plan set forth in our application, as it will actually enhance the beauty of the dis district and the well-being of the township of South Orange. Thank you. Would you describe the <clears throat> existing condition of the interior of the structure that you want, that you want to renovate? Existing condition in relation to where we no no what are. you have right now currently we have three dental operatories in our dental operatories they're all <laughs> below industry standard I actually have my panoramic X-ray unit in one of my operatories which is not ideal but it is a technology that is a state of the art technology but it is not in the ideal location I am in approximately a thousand square feet with this. It violates a couple of things in terms of privacy. I can't have a confidential conversation with a patient without somebody hearing in the other rooms. Or at the front desk, 
there can't be a confidential financial conversation without people in the reception area hearing the conversation. We are just that confined. So a lot of this is related to privacy, confidentiality. We also have, my wife is a pediatric dentist that works part-time in the office. The other issue that we have is when she has a non-compliant patient, for lack of a better term, or a crier, the noise from that patient disturbs future potential patients. It's not very good for the practice image, and it can be heard on the telephone when people are calling in. So a lot of, a lot of design is also based on sound filtering, and that, that's, that's our current situation. So we really need the space to better protect our patient's privacy, protect the privacy of our patient files, because right now, currently, our file cabinets are somewhat in an exposed area. We lock them, but it's still not totally compliant with uh, HIPAA privacy laws. Do you presently have a computer room? We, well, we, in our, our, we don't have a computer room per se. We actually have our server in the basement, which is si kind of in a vulnerable area, as we all know. South Orange every now and then is susceptible to flooding, and that would be a disaster for us because we have no other space in the current area to have a server. Our compressor and suction units are also down there as a result of this. Would you <clears throat> excuse me, briefly describe the waiting area as you enter the office from South Orange Avenue? As you enter from South Orange Avenue, our waiting area is to the right. And it really consists of a small sofa and a love seat and our fish tank. It, it can probably seat about five to six people. Is it adequate for your needs? It is not really adequate for our needs. And one of the reasons for our design as such is that, for instance, in the pediatric component of our practice, a mother may have one child with an appointment but bring two other children or their friends. All of a sudden, one family with one patient has overwhelmed our waiting area, and we have no additional space to serve any future patients that may be coming in in the next appointment slot. So our, our goal with this particular plan is to allow the mothers or loved ones to be able to sit in the operatories with their children as opposed to congest the waiting area. So it would actually be mutually beneficial. How many dental chairs do you, pres <clears throat> do you presently have? We currently have three. And how many would you like to have according to your plans? We would like to have six. And six is related to the fact that, for instance, with children, when we have an emergency of any sort, we really have no overflow rooms. So for multiple reasons, if a person's in discomfort or in pain, we, they're sitting in what is our waiting area and they may wait an inordinate amount of time because we don't have a room to place them. So it's just a matter of having the availability of having overflow rooms for emergencies that do occur. Do you presently have a consultation room? No, we do not. Do you presently have an office of your, for yourself where you can I do not. I've been practicing 19 years in this space, and I literally don't have an office to sit down and do paperwork. <clears throat> so that all of these things are being factored in our ex expansion to address things that have hampered ideal treatment and business. Describe the storage area for me. Our storage closet If you can is call it that. Is actually our old dark room that used to consist of dip tanks if in, in healthcare. And since we use digital radiography, that has now become our storage closet. So it is four feet by two. Tell me about your intention to acquire and install modern digital equipment. Well, we actually do have a lot of current technology that requires space. We have a laser, we have a CAD CAM unit, we have digital radiography, we have a panoramic unit. All of these things 
were significant investments, but the, the type of practice we have, we believe in being cutting edge and providing the best for our patients. What we're not able to do currently is, with that philosophy, is provide them an environment consistent with that philosophy. A lot of our technology requires a certain amount of space to be utilized properly from a venting standpoint, from, from a power standpoint, from a mobility standpoint to go from room to room to room. Our space constricts us in such a way that setting up rooms and breaking them down has become very, very difficult <clears throat> with today's current technologies. Would, would you tell this board what experience you have had in taking courses with respect to office design? I've been studying this, this for a while, trying to be as ergonomic as possible. I've taken over 80 hours, not at NYU. I'm on the faculty at NYU, but I actually traveled to different dental conventions and conferences, specifically <coughs> taking courses in office design and how I can best utilize the space. A lot of this project was actually done by a specific dental group in Massachusetts called Design Ergonomics. Their specialty is designing practices in as efficient way as possible without wasting space. If you've noticed in those particular plans, there's no cabinetry. Cabinetry in a dental practice is a lot of wasted space. So their philosophy instead is not to have a lot of cabinetry in the room, but to have rolling carts to go in and out. We have a cart area called the rapid cart area, <clears throat> which makes it easier to move the equipment into the room do the procedure, move it out of the room, and go to a central sterilization and storage area. That lack of counter space that's wasted allows us to be a lot more efficient. So that's one of the big philosophies um, in the design ergonomics feature. With respect to the plans that were prepared <coughs> by <clears throat> Mr. Carino, the architect, uh, did you confer with him? Did you work with him on these? I conferred with him. I, my major um, dialogue was with, with specifically with the design ergonomics firm in Massachusetts in getting the whole dental component done. And then we conferred with Mr. Corvino to include the exterior and the other aspects of the project. Are you familiar with all of these architectural plans yep. that are marked as A2? Yes, I am. And the board has copies of, of these plans. These are the uh, architectural plans, and I think they're dated 2714. No revisions. I just want to make sure that's the set we have. We didn't get we didn't get a revised set of those. We got a revised set of Mr. Keller's drawings. That is correct. It's on A1 and A2. Uh, no revision dated 272014. They're mounted on board for reference. Rich, Rich, Rich. Microphone. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Friedland, would you like to offer the architectural plans as A1? Both sheets? They're, they're marked as A2 on the plans. No, it's A1. Okay. A1. And A2, I think it is. Mr. Dwight, we'll mark them combined as A1 or A1 and A2? Combined as A1. Combined as A1. Architectural plans. Dr. Rosemont, approximately how many patient files do you presently have in your office? I would say approximately uh, 1,800 uh, patient files we have presently. Do you have room for any more? No, we, we actually don't have room for file cabinets. We are going paperless, another reason because of our space, but also that's the future of health care that uh, physicians and, and dentists and, and health care providers will be utilizing digital technology. So we are actually converting to digital now. But we have maxed our paper charts 
probably five or six years ago. Now, now you've continuously run your practice for the last 19 years, is that correct? Correct. Um, would you tell me if you treat second generation patients at the present time? Yeah, we have a family practice. My wife is a pediatric dentist, and we actually have the, the you know, I guess this is a product of success, but we're actually seeing some of the children now coming with their families. So I guess that means I'm getting older. But I guess we feel very proud that we've able to grow with the families that we started with, where some of the children are now coming in with their children and, you know, they're moving along in their professional careers. So, you know, we really enjoy that. We really, we're a family type practice. You know, we, we believe in, our patients are a family. That's always been my philosophy and that's the way I practice healthcare. Did there, come a <clears throat> did there come a time when you were compelled to look for alternate offices because of the cramp space? Yes. You Would know, you explain we, that. We, we've, we looked because we realized that this issue was coming along. You know, we were growing and just on top of each other. We've always kept abreast of availability of professional space in South Orange, Maplewood, Millburn, and Livingston. But we always came back to home for several reasons. One, that's where our patients know us to be. Two, South Orange Avenue is a very well-traveled road. Three, Seton Hall University is the best landmark that you could have for a new patient to try to find our office. So as a result, that would be our best location. You were present with me when we appeared before the Historic Preservation Committee. Yes, yes I was. Sometime in, in April. Yes. Uh, do you know what the determination was of the committee? Uh, the tr determination of the committee was that they had no issues with our particular <coughs> project because we were doing no changes to the exterior of the property, only enhancing and refreshing. And there is no plan to alter or change any part of the exterior of this building. That is correct. And you can retain the identical footprint, is that correct? That is correct. <coughs> Mr. Friedland, uh, yes. just, just in case the members of the board don't have that letter from the Historic Preservation Commission, um, I'll just, I'll, I don't know if everybody has it or not. Does everybody have it? Okay. So. It, it, what it says is that they, they would offer no comment on the application pending before the zoning board uh, in that the proposed improvements will have no impact on the historic character of the property, site, or district in which it's located. It wasn't an approval. It was, it was just no comment. Well, which, okay, I, I'll accept your, your commentary. But well, it's we, not a commentary. That's what it said. But we did testify for a considerable period of time, and we submitted an application that was quite similar to the one that we filed before this board. So perhaps I jumped a little bit okay. by saying they approved it. Dr. Rosemont, approximately how many patients a day do you uh, treat? We see approximately about 12 patients a day when my hygienist is present. We, we average about 45 minutes to an hour per procedure. Again, our practice is a high-touch, high-value type appointment. It is not a clinic-y type of thing in any sort of way. I enjoy sitting down and talking to the, the patients about how school, how's the family, how's... We actually have a few families that we have four generations, grandparents on, on, the, on great grandparents down to grandparents. So I enjoy that. How's everybody doing? This one going to college, that one going to college. So. Our visits are probably normal in the industry standard, but that's, that's how we like to practice, and I think that's what differentiates us from, from other healthcare professional practices. Now, with the existing space that you have today, would you be able to accommodate any additional patients? The, our biggest, biggest issue is when, when patients have emergencies now, we've, we've gotten to the critical mass of people call when they have urgent care. We're in a situation now where we can't get them in as quickly as we'd like. As you know, we have Mar the Marshall School around the corner, we may have a patient there that falls on the playground and cracks a tooth. 
That's a person that should be get patient that should come in right away and go right into a room. Just based on the capacity of our office right now, it puts us in a situation where we either remove somebody from the room, room to get that child in right away, or they sit in the waiting area in a distressed situation. Both of those are not ideal. So we'd like to be in a situation where we can handle emergent care immediately, get them in a room, at least get them comfortable, and let them wait. The same thing occurs when we have longer procedures. If, if uh, Dr. Strong, my wife, is doing a sedation procedure to allow the patient time to recover and before we allow them to leave the office. So the increase in capacity is not necessarily for a volume thing, it's for a quality of care standpoint. Would you <clears throat> describe the complement of full-time and part-time employees that are in your office at the present time? Presently, we have two administrative staff full-time, two dental assistant staff uh, full-time, and two part-time dental hygienists. And you are the only practicing dentist in the office at the present time? No, my wife is As aside, aside from her? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how often do the two of you mer practice at the same time? Uh, we never practice at the same time, again, because of the volume of the, the it, it just wouldn't work. We even tried at one time early in practice to have what we call family day, where a parent could see me and the child could see my wife, but it, it, it didn't work out well because the children were, were always running in to see what was going on with their parents and looking in their parents' mouths and the parents would take, sit down. So we found that that didn't work. And also as the practice grew, it, it just it, it didn't work because if we had a crying child and now we have a new adult, they hear the child crying and it, it's a little bit disconcerting. So we do not practice at the same time. We, we split our schedules and such, so when the pediatric <clears throat> component of the practice is there, we don't have adults there, and vice versa. And, and your wife's practice is limited to pediatric, is that correct? Yes, she's a yeah. pediatric specialist. Uh, I don't have any further questions. Okay, questions from the board? Um, there are some more questions by the planner. Patients could be seen with this expansion? Could um, be seen or would be seen? Could be. The way I practice, again, high touch, high value, we're just looking to be able to possibly get some more time for our hygienists to see patients on their maintenance visits. The way I practice in terms of, of cheers is just a matter of having the emergent care available and possibly having an opportunity where my wife and I could work one day a week again together or to being in a highly regulated industry myself I find it very interesting and credible that um, that these are made for safety and privacy I completely relate to that um, but one of our obligations is to look at the, the overall impact of any variance that we issue in the future beyond just the current ap applicant so when seeing the plans, I thought initially that it was a huge expansion from a business perspective, from like the business mind of how much more revenue could be generated, how, you know, looking at, looking at that side of it. And now that you explain the, the privacy and the safety and all that, that makes, a, that makes a lot of sense to me too. But I'm still curious, you know, if we, if we approve this application, it's, it has a permanent impact. So given the changing regulations, is there a huge potential increase in use if it wasn't your practice? <coughs> you, 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 there's also the Dental Practice Act that in the state of New Jersey it has a pretty rigid Dental Practice Act. Only two hygienists or ancillary staff can be per doctor on site. So you really can't create quote unquote a clinically atmosphere because of the Dental Practice Act. Gotcha. Not even the board. The Dental Practice Act says only two hygienists per doctor. Okay. So the maximum, and we don't practice it, would be two doctors and four hygienists, max. Max, to meet your own regulatory requirements. It's a, it's a state regulatory requirement. Okay. And, and again, we don't plan on practicing that way. So let's just say in 30 years, the next doctor comes in, they're still maxed out by certain state regu regulatory guidelines. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Is, if I Mr. Breen. Um, 
is there is there a plan to hire an additional dentist beyond yourself and your wife? That is not the plan. I mean, I, I have two children. I have one son in, in, in college right now. I don't know if he's going into the... So into better hire a few more dentists. <laughs> well, no. but um, um, that is not the plan. If, if the way we practice, I'm pretty comprehensive in my care. I'm pretty um, aggressive in my continuing education. I'm on the faculty at NYU. I've been on the faculty at Howard University, and I take a great... I, been past president of the New Jersey Academy General Dentistry Board. So I'm very into continuing education. I'm very into trying to provide as many of the services as possible to my patients directly. So how we practice, how we practice, a lot of times we will refer out procedures that we may feel out of our realm more so than bring somebody in. The only possible professional we, we may think about bringing in is an anesthesiologist to help with the sedation of the children. That's it, but no, our, our plans are not to, to do that. Mr. Ring? Others? Mr. Adler? <clears throat> Dr. Rosemond, your plans show four doctor treatment rooms. What are they called? Operatories? Correct. Operatories. And two assuming hygiene. you don't Pardon me? And two hygiene rooms. Yes, but the, the doctor treatment rooms, assuming you even save one f for at all times for an emergency, why do you have three treatment rooms, three doctor operatories? The way, the way we practice is I'll be seeing a patient actively. The next patient may come in, and we can anesthetize that patient. And while that patient is... Um, obtaining anesthesia, I can complete my procedure in the first operatory. The third operatory is the availability to have for emergent care or for a quick visit like suture removal, denture adjustment, things like that, short five, ten minute procedures. So, but okay. And you, you have to understand too that if we do certain surgical procedures, we do implants, we do surgical extraction, sometimes I just want the patients to sit there for about 15, 20 minutes and relax before I let them, before I dismiss them. So as such, in the past, again, we put those patients in the waiting area. That's not the ideal thing for a patient to be sitting in the waiting area with, with ice compress on their face and a new person walks in. So it's about having the availability to let patients stay back in the operatory area until they're ready to be dismissed from the office and not create congestion in our waiting area. So, so it looks like you're gaining two seats in the waiting area, two or three? <clears throat> Here, close, oh. Take a look. You have to take the microphone with you if you're going to. Thank you. <clears throat> When we, look, when we look at the waiting area here, it's a schematic in terms of the seating area. Currently, we just have a sofa and a love seat here. That's it. You won't find it. You're on. You're fine. Okay. So these two seats currently aren't there. It's just a schematic that was drawn in. It's not necessarily going to be our final seating area seating arrangement, but if you look at the square footage, I forget what it is, but it isn't different, from, much different from where we currently are. Okay, well, because I thought you had testified that one of the reasons you wanted to do this was because you sometimes had patients who bring their friends and Yeah, they, I did, okay. and, that's, mm -hmm. and, and that's my point. When a mother comes with their child now, they will have the ability to come into the room and not make this area congested because family members will come in. It's a phenomenon that we notice. A mother will come in, the one child will have the appointment, and you'll see three other children come behind them, play date afterwards, other siblings, and immediately totally occupies the waiting area. With this alignment, we'll now be able to let mom and the child that's being treated come back, and possibly a second child if it's a toddler, which will relieve some of the congestion in this area. So that's our thought processes behind having these operatories, the availability for people to recover from procedures, for moms to be back there, for screaming children, all of those things. If you know, there's a door here. The door 
in this area is what our soundproof component is for the screaming child. So people now in the waiting area don't hear the drill sound which people immediately cringe on because these are some of the things that have come forth from the office design. People don't want it to have the dental smells, they don't want to hear the drill, they don't want to hear any sort of instrumentation going on when they're sitting here. They have enough anxiety already leading into the appointment. So we have totally removed as much as we can the stimuli that affects patients in the waiting area. So again, these chairs, it's still based on decreasing the flow here and getting more of the mothers and or pa adult patients that need more recovery time back here and not have somebody sit here with an ice pack on their face again or gauze in their mouth or whatever, or drowsy because they're still recovering from a sedative type procedure. Um, so I think you said, oh, you conferred with the architect, you conferred with some, you conferred Design with some. Design Ergonomics is specifically a firm in Massachusetts that designs dental offices throughout the country. Their philosophy, again, is how to have an as, as efficient, safe, clean, productive office in as small a space as possible. And if, again, if you know in these rooms, there's no cabinetry because cabinets take up a lot of space. So if you had cabinetry, it would be, again, a confined space. What we have is a rapid cart system, and you see where it says mobile tech. Those units are mobile units that actually roll into the room so that the procedure can be formed and rolled out. Now, when the procedure is completed, it's rolled back into where you see sterilization and resupply, and the dental assistant will break down Clean the, clean, clean the trays, things like in this area. Again, thinking about, and then going back to disinfect the room. <clears throat> so this philosophy, has found, it, what's been found is that a lot of times things get put in drawers. They can't be located at the time you want to perform a procedure. You order another one, and later on you find out that you had one in room one. So with centralization of supply and sterilization, you keep a more efficient inventory and know exactly what you have available in terms of supply and instruments. And if, so that group in, in Boston did the interior design? They did, the, they, yes, they did the office interior. Okay, and you conferred with Mr. Corvino about what? Mr. Corvino is a local architect that took their design and placed it into our footprint of our property. Okay. <laughs> All right. He just did the drawing. He did the, of the drawing. design that the other group did. Correct. Okay. So I think you said that you had maxed out your room for paper files five or six years ago. Yes. What have you been doing since then? Well, actually, we've been trying to age our extremely old ones and shredding them. And then the others were actually taking them and storing them in the basement which becomes an issue when a patient that hasn't been in in seven or eight years comes walking in, and now we have to go into the basement and search for their chart. And that, all of those files will be where in the? We're going digital. We're, we're, as, as we're progressing, one of the things we're going to do is shift to paperless, which is a trend of healthcare in general. Right. So everything will be digitized. One, it'll, it'll cut down on, again, wasted space. And that's just the way things are going. So when, when we're communicating with other healthcare professionals, information can be emailed back and forth. Okay, so you would be doing that with these files in any event? Correct. I am. Correct. Okay. So <clears throat> there are, when a hygienist is there, your office sees 12 patients a day total, or that's? 12, 12 to 16, I'm, I'm giving you an average, 12 to 16, because she takes between an hour to an hour and a half on her patients, depending on what she's doing. Wow. Because if she's doing a deep scaling, 
we, we tend to do two quadrants at one time. We, we, you know, a lot of our patients are from South Orange Maple, but they, they work in the city. So we try to maximize their appointments. If they take a half a day off or whatever, we try to maximize their appointments in as comfortable a way as possible. So the hygienist takes between an hour and an hour and a half on average with her particular patient. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if this application is not granted, are you, are you not going to paint the outside of your building and fix the broken gutters and things? No, we're, we're obviously going to address, address that. I mean, we, we painted in the past. It, it's this that I'd like to incorporate everything. Make sure you're talking into the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we've, we've painted and obviously addressed things in the past in terms of maintenance. Um, my goal is to obviously, if things go positively, which I hope they, sh they will, that we will incorporate everything in one comprehensive project. Okay. Can you, just just uh, a question oh, about, yeah. about uh, the current parking situation. So the parking you have now um, isn't <laughs> ideal either in the sense you have to stack cars up. How does parking work when you have multiple patients in the office? You know, par it, it's interesting that you, you brought that up because since we've been here, I. I we, patients find a way, and then I realized what was happening more than I realized was because a lot of patients are local, spouses will drop their significant others off. They may walk to the train if they're going into the city. Parents drop their children off. So we have a lot of patients that either walk, get dropped off, and get picked up. And then the other spots are just patients pull in and pull out because our average time, hour, hour and a half. So it really. So one of the concerns that was raised by the in in the planner's note was that when anytime you stack cars, you face a situation where a patient may be blocked in. I agree. Interestingly enough, I think because of the arrangement, patients don't tend to park in our driveway. So there's usually two or three spots in the driveway. The ones that park there consistently are our elderly or some of our patients that may be. Um, and so then, where are they parking? They're, they're parking right in the front of the practice on South Orange Avenue and maybe a little bit of overflow on Elm Court. Okay. Ms. Gruel, you seem. Um, actually, that one of the questions, oh, is that on? One of, one of the questions that we had were where are your employees and patients coming from and do they live in the immediate vicinity and are you, a lot of your patients Seton Hall University students or faculty? More faculty and administration, very few students. The students tend to be more emergent care. We're on Seton Hall's emergency call list as one of the dentists, if maybe the only dentist, I don't know. So most of our Seton Hall patients are emergent care. We have a lot more faculty and administrators that are regular patients. In terms of, uh, what was your other question? Oh, to pre our, my, my staff comes from South Orange and the surrounding communities. A few of them walk actually That's one of them he he walks and uh or his wife drops him off in inclement weather so they don't they they don't always add to the parking load as well so one of the full-time people walk and then you, the other one still use they the still car. drive or get get rides some i saw one today who normally drives and she was picked up so it varies based on their situation. I don't know. But one always walks or gets dropped off and picked up by his wife. Thank you. Other questions, Mr. Descalis? Yeah, I was just curious. Um, you said that you have um, 18,000 case files. Or no, 1,800. Oh, 1,800 patient yeah. files. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that one. I'm like, wow. <laughs> That's a, lot 18, of, I, I, oh, that's a lot of history. But no, but the question I had is how many patients do you have? That is patients. That is, that's how many patients, not files. It's current patients. For us, a file is a patient. Okay. You know, so now keep in mind, that's a family. So a family of four and four or five. You know, I, I think some, some industries, a file could be, you know, any number of clients. For us, it's, it's patient files. It's a, Okay. Better, better uh, so I'm trying to get a sense for um, how that's changed in, during your tenure. So you used to work for the dentist that, that... No, I never worked for the dentist. I've always been... The, when I've been there, okay. I've been the owner. 
of the practice. I purchased okay. the practice. Oh, I see. I didn't realize. From, from a dentist. Dentist. Thank you again for clarifying. I thought it was one of those, you know, you know, one I've step. I've actually been a dentist. Third. I graduated in 19 years. You give it away your age. See, when you get yeah. old, 20, 29 years. 29 years. Okay. I've been in South Orange 19 years. So can you tell me, were there, were there more than one dentist in the office there's, when you purchased it? There never, there's always been just one dentist. I'm the first one that actually had two, and that's because my spouse your wife, is right. the other dentist. Do you, do you have a sense of, I don't know if you took over the, the patient load from the previous dentist or not? The, the you know previous, many, many to give you an idea, they had? when we, yes, I can tell you exactly because that was part of our cut. He had 122 patients. You've gone from 122 patients to 1,800 patients. Correct. And that's 1,800 active because we've also had through the years patients move out of the area. Unfortunately, we have patients that die. And then not everybody also stays with you, just, just the nature of sure. dental practice. Right. So the 1,800 is more or less active. Wow. Some, and we define active as been in the office in the last three and a half, four years. So in a sense, you're a victim of your own success, right? That, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. All right, you know. and so to, to try to accommodate um, not just uh, the, the, the feel of the practice for the, the patients, is a, it's a growth in the number of patients. Um, you're roughly doubling this, this, the footprint of your practice, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's, that was just, that's fine. And then um, what's the story with the residence part of the use? Are you gonna continue to rent out space for residential? No, I'm not. The, the, what I plan on doing, I used to live in the practice. What I plan on doing with the sec is to have my, finally have my, my own office space to create employee lounge that allow my employees a chance to just sit down and eat because presently right now we kind of close the office at lunchtime and they sit down and eat in the waiting area and then the patient comes 20 minutes early and then everybody scurries up in, into the lab. I just like my employees to have a place to sit down and eat lunch and relax for a little while, put their bags down, you know, put their things down. And for myself personally to have an office space to be able to handle some of the logistical and administrative uh, aspects of practice. So that's what we plan on doing with us. And then having an administrator spot too for insurance. Since that they sounds ideal, without a doubt. Do you, have, um, do you have a relationship with the, the other members of the residential community? Oh, yeah. Um, are some of them your patients, I would imagine? Yeah, some of them are yeah. my patients. Some board members here are my patients or past. Uh, so I heard, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Okay. I actually asked one of my neighbors to pop in, and uh, he said he would try to pop by. My, my direct neighbor. Tell him who he is. Uh, 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 John Gay, who uh, I think he's a, uh, he is a U.S. attorney, and he's my direct neighbor on the Elm Court side, and I told him I was presenting today, and if, if he had an opportunity, could he just come by and okay. say a word? Oh, well, good to hear from him if he shows. I hope so. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, okay, I have a couple of questions. Um, I just want to get it, get some numbers down here. So you, you testified that you have about 1,000 square feet of current office space on the Correct, first floor. Correct, about. Okay. How much total square footage is on the first floor? You know, I used to know, and I actually forgot that number. It just slipped my mind. Is that something Mr. Keller would know? Or we could figure out? We could figure it out. I'm just trying to figure out how much. I, I think Mr. I Keller might be able to respond. I think that the, um, the existing square footage is just under, just under 900 square, between 900 and 940 square feet for the existing area. Um, the total on both floors is about 2,300. We calculated, I, I can try to get you the square footage on each floor, but we calculated that the net square footage, that's the area available to patients um, and offices, et cetera, um, comes up to just, uh, just under 1,600 square feet. So um, the net's about 1,600. Clearly, um, if, uh, if you look at <coughs> the, uh, the, the package that was submitted, uh, actually, existing dental office is 760, excuse me, and the existing, the remaining portion uh, takes you up to about uh, a net of 1,520. So that's shown on Casey and Keller's site plan sheet two of two, 
Uh, that's the uh, that's part of your application package. So I don't know if it needs to be marked as an exhibit or not. Yeah, let's um, mark that as A2, please. So we'll mark the whole Casey and Keller package as A2. On uh, on sheet two in the site plan, you can see the uh, there's a dash dividing line that shows the dental space is actually <coughs> 760 square feet, and then um, the remainder portion of uh, of available space takes you up to the 1,500 square foot roughly. Um, in the space available to patrons, uh, patients, uh, first floor offices, et cetera. Uh, the overall square footage of the entire building is, a, is just under 2,300 square feet. And that's the area of first floor and second floor. First floor Do and second floor. Does not include floor. basement. Does not include and basement. Doesn't include an attic story. Does not I include assume there's some story. space up in that attic. There's a little bit of storage space in the okay. attic. Uh, essentially, <coughs> um, in the, and I, I don't want to jump into my testimony, but uh, essentially, when the doctor went through the evaluation process to streamline the first floor and, and bring the practice into current um, technology with a number of operatories and the privacy issues, essentially there was no longer a way to get residential use on the second floor. We, didn't, we looked at building an exterior stair. We didn't want to add to the building. And so once we realized that that was orphaned and could only be accessed by coming through the dental practice, the dentist said, well, as long as I can't use it for residential and it's there and it's part of the building already, I might as well give my give my um, my employees their break room, create an office for myself, get an insurance space, um, and so as long as as long as we have these space, we might as well we'll make it the dream practice uh, because currently that stuff all occurs in the 760 square feet. The first floor is optimized for the dental practice, and we had space left over. We just couldn't find a way to make it residential, and we also didn't want to introduce a rental apartment. We thought that um, uh, the expansion into the residential portion um, was appropriate and could be handled with parking. I'll get into that later. And so we really, we thought at that point um, it was leftover space that could be utilized as a, as a perk for the employees and, and doctor himself. But those are the rough square footages. Okay. Um, back to the doctor. Um, I guess I'm, just, I'm trying, like some of the other people, to get my arms around with that many rooms, how we only I, how I also we forgot there was a point that uh, um, I was just reminded of that going back to the room, one of the rooms is is designed to be a quiet room, which is specifically geared towards the pediatric component, and a quiet room is actually a room <laughs> that for lack of a better term is is soundproofed, not necessarily literally, but when you have a, a screamer. That's, so, the, that's the room with the door on it, I assume. Correct. That's the room with the door on it. So the other thing is that I, I, I do uh, implant procedures and longer type procedures. So cer certain rooms, not that they'll be fully dedicated to those procedures, but they'll be more geared towards procedures. And because of the instrumentation needed, it, 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 it's designed that way. Can, sure. can, you, can you explain what's an insurance room? Is that where they come in and audit you? No, not an insurance you? room. Just an area where they'll be able to speak to insurance companies about people's, you know, health care. Because those, those calls can be long uh, by design by the insurance companies. So being able to take it, again, out of the area where the conversation can be heard, you know, by people who have the concern, yeah. we, we can bring that upstairs. Oh, okay. I wish all doctors did that. Well, that's the ideal scenario, right. but you're right, because I'm sure, I don't know, but a lot of people probably have heard conversations probably that you'd rather not hear, and then you start to wonder, is my information being discussed like that? So this is an opportunity to eliminate that. Okay. Um, questions from Ms. Gruel? No. Mr. Randa? Um, Yes, this is a question uh, regarding the architectural layout and maybe a question for Mr. Keller as well. Um, ADA accessibility. Right now, there aren't any um, ramps or anything up to the level to the waiting room. Was any consideration given towards you know, making it accessible? There was some consideration. We looked and, and we, we don't believe it meets the standard of a required handicap accessibility, but we did take a look actually at the topography uh, in the front yard and actually uh, it would work very well to just come from the sidewalk and uh, put a ramp that would cover the two steps into the building. And so with really no change, you would, you would take a concrete walk and you would turn that into a ramp that would essentially, it would hold level grade. So while the grade drops towards the front door, you would hold level grade and you could accommodate, uh, you could remove those two steps. There's no step at the threshold. So if you, if you replace the concrete walk, 
with an elevated ramp that would start at zero elevation and go up to about uh, 14 inches, you could get direct uh, uh, um, barrier-free access into, into the, um, to the waiting room and the rest of the facility. And so we took a look at that. Uh, we weren't sure if it was required by law, but the doctor actually did say he asked us to take a look at that, and we'd be certainly happy to further investigate it or, or make it a condition or, or, or make that improvement if the board so desired. Okay, and uh, to follow on that, the, um, the parking area, the, the driveway that's there, I understand it's primarily for staff. Um, but uh, there, uh, there wasn't a layout or striping plan or anything that shows how those spaces are allocated, and there isn't a handicapped parking space in the driveway, which is a requirement for a uh, commercial parking lot. Uh, the, the, the driveway is not designated for staff. It's not designated for staff. It's actually the staff tends to park, if they p bring their autos, sometimes right in the front of the practice. The driveway, we've always utilized it as, or thought of it as patient parking. Okay, well, so I when, I, when, I, when, I, when I park in there sometimes, and one other, we always make sure that there's at least three spots. And a lot of our elderly patients and our patients that are handicapped will automatically just put their vans or whatever in there. Okay, so uh, but by designated, it's not striped. The, the spaces aren't identified on the, on the, the site they've, plan they've, drawing. They've been told to make, basically make those spots available for, for, uh, for patients more so than just, I, I won't let them just fill the spot with just staff spot. It, even our whole staff, if they all brought their vehicles, which some of them don't drive, I would not allow them to uh, just fill that spot I think with that consideration. I think what he's, what he's saying is um, he would like it to be done. Oh, well, that and, not uh, a problem. and I believe there is a requirement to have. I, I don't have a problem the, with that. A requirement of at least one handicap accessible, and in this case, it would have to be van accessible um, parking space. and. I think it would be beneficial for the board to understand how the parking layout is going to work because when you create that van space, you need a five-foot um, clear area where nobody can park. That's the, you know, the area for the lift or, or whatever, and then a minimum of an eight-foot wide stall for that handicapped space. Um, that's going to eat greatly into the width of the, the, uh, the driveway parking area that you have right now. Um, and the other concern I have is, is the number of spaces. While I understand you, you don't intend to drastically expand your current practice you're just making it more efficient and you know better for the situation they have now and I understand that in the future though there's there, there's a lot of space here and there is the potential for another you know someday when when the kids are out of college and you decide to retire there is a possibility for another um, professional to take this space and um, the reality is they may have a different program, they may have different patients, they may have patients from out of town um, that do travel and you know, don't walk to the practice. And the concern, my biggest concern is the parking, um, not just for the current practice, but in the future, how, how that's going to be affected. I'm sure that's something that Mr. Keller is going to address. I believe Mr. Keller will address, address that in his testimony. Other questions, Sal? Um, well, the, the accessibility, the parking, and the access, I guess, from the parking lot to the front, I guess, right now, they either walk out to the street, to the sidewalk, and then up the front walk, or they kind of cross the, the they, yard. They, no, they, well, if some walk parked, across the if, lawn. If, if they're parked in the driveway. And, but a lot just walk around the sidewalk and go right into the office. Okay. okay. Any other questions of the doctor? I'll open it to the public. None seen. I'll close it to the public. Mr. Friedland, next yes. witness. I certainly do, Mr. Keller. You know, I just if, just to, to clarify the, the point, <clears throat> there's a disconnect. Mr. Renda was talking about the parking um, in the in the driveway being used by employees. It actually says in the application that the front two spots in the driveway are reserved for employees. So just as a matter of clarification, that isn't the case. I'll just speak on that a little bit. The, the reason why we tend to save the employees for those two spots is because they're going to be there all day. Right. No, I understood so that. So that, right. you know, patients won't go all the way down there anyway because they're scared of being blocked in anyway. So I said okay. if you're parking in the driveway, 
utilize those two spots first. Okay. familiar with this application? Yes, I am. And would you <clears throat> describe the subject property? Uh, certainly. The, um, let, me, uh, let me mark a couple of exhibits first. Projected. I guess I don't have my stage voice. Um, if I, I have these as a handout, uh, there's two sheets. So do you want to mark them A2, A3 combined or A3 and A4? A3 combined. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Tell us what they are. Once I get back on the microphone. There should be plenty for everyone. Thank you. Uh, the first sheet on A3 is an aerial photo looking to the north. Uh, our plotter wasn't doing very well, so we plotted out uh, hand uh, size ones for you on 11 by 17. And uh, the second component of A3, uh, that by the way, the aerial photo is uh, looking to the north is taken from the Microsoft website bing.com. It represents photography from approximately 2010, 2011. We did add the yellow and black line, which delineates the property, and we labeled the streets on top of that, but otherwise it is uh, photography from the website. Photo board uh, number one would be the second part of A3. That has six photographs of the site. Uh, they were all taken by Casey and Keller, taken by uh, myself on April 12, 2014, uh, just before the Historic Preservation Commission meeting. Um, so I'll refer to both of these uh, sheets. The, uh, the property, The property uh, is designated uh, both as 481 South Orange Avenue and as 2 Elm Court on the tax maps. It is obviously therefore a corner lot, 7,180 square feet, uh, 0.16 acre site uh, at that corner uh, directly across from Seton Hall University. It is located wholly within the RA60 residential zone um, and it is also located in the Montrose Park Historic District. The, uh, the site contains the two and a half story uh, structure uh, that uh, has uh, been used as a combined residence and home professional uh, dentistry office for more than 60 years. The, uh, the residential portion uh, faces Elm Court with a generous porch. Um, it's a structure, a historic structure that's uh, consistent with the rest of the fabric of the uh, surrounding Montrose Historic Park area. Uh, the dental office, which was an appendix to the back of the, of the uh, uh, existing building, uh, is accessed off of South Orange Avenue only. Uh, there is also a frame shed we'll talk about a little later, and there is a driveway uh, along the easterly portion accessed only off of South, South Orange Avenue with no driveway along uh, Elm Court. The, uh, quickly to run through the site photography, um, starting with uh, the Elm Court side, the photograph number one is the adjacent home to the north along Elm Court. Uh, this shows the rest of the fabric as you move into the Elm Court. Many of the houses are very similar in style to the two that appear uh, on photograph number one. Um, standing in front of that adjacent property at uh, 10 Elm Court and looking back up at the subject property, you can see there's a, a, a large evergreen tree um, that uh, blocks that uh, northerly facade of the existing dentistry practice. None of this massing, none of this is changing other than painting, uh, fixing gutters, fixing corner boards, etc. Um, moving around to the, the uh, photograph number three, again you see the existing landscaping, generous porch. Uh, that landscaping will be uh, basically spruced up trim, maybe supplemented some on the uh, South Orange Avenue side, but there are essentially no plans to modify that. We think the, uh, the foliage and vegetation is appropriate to the home. Uh, and it's rather, rather attractive. Uh, that door will remain. It is the primary residential door. It'll, it is not be being, uh, will not be used. It essentially will be locked from the inside. Um, so the appearance will be that it is still a residence that faces Elm Court. Um, the generous porch will remain. The facade will remain. There was no changes. 
Coming around to the South Orange Avenue side, you can see that the low uh, dental office that was uh, appended um, when the dental practice was added to the home residential use some 60 years ago. Um, we thought, uh, you know, we've been working with the doctor for more than three years on this project and trying to find him another space within the community. Kept coming back to what can we do with this space. Um, the doctor at one point thought about trying to get, you know, keep residential on the second floor through an apartment. Um, we really, we really um, cautioned him against any kind of expansion up vertically above that second floor. Uh, we thought it was appropriate to keep the main mass of the house, keep the character, um, not do any appendages, not do a stair tower on the back that would get access to a residential second floor. Essentially keep the character and if it turned out that his optimal floor plan couldn't allow for residential access, either to a, a, a smaller residence or an apartment above, uh, so be it, it would limit the, uh, the intensity of the use. Uh, so essentially this facade is remaining. Again, you can see from here, um, working with the topography, it's basically a straight shot if we come from the sidewalk out to the, out to the door, so it would be relatively easy to provide barrier-free access uh, to the front door. Um, the next photograph, number five. Mr. Keller, just, this, just one, one quick interruption on yes. photograph four. The curb cut and apron there, I assume that's to the old garage? Yeah, right? it's, it's been orphaned for many years, but it's, okay. uh, it's uh, uh, people park in front of it. You can see uh, what's, a, what's interesting to know, too, and that is there is a post just to the west edge of the uh, no longer used apron and curb cut, and it states right on there, SHU, Seton Hall University Zone Permit Parking, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and then that parking ends there. So there are a total of uh, eight spaces on the north side of South of Seton, I'm sorry, of uh, South Orange Avenue, between Warren Court and Elm Court, that are restricted between uh, essentially Monday through Friday between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. only to Seton Hall uh, parking um, permit holders. Um, just between uh, that sign and the um, the uh, Elm Court intersection, there is room for three cars to park that are unrestricted. Um, as you move to the east, there are, again, as I said, eight car parking that are restricted. And then as you get up just before you get to Warren Court, Warren uh, Court, there are another two spaces that are unrestricted. So uh, the parking along, along South Orange Avenue is restricted during the week, not restricted during the weekends. And I'll get into that when we get into parking in a few minutes. Uh, photograph number I'm five sorry, shows. Carol, how many run unrestricted? There are five, un five unrestricted between Warren Court, excuse me, and. Uh, and Elm Court on the northerly side of South Orange Avenue. The, uh, the next photograph is the uh, home immediately to the east of us. This is a uh, home professional office uh, that was the subject of a, of a Board of Adjustment approval, I believe, uh, a few years ago, it was a pain management doctor uh, that has offices in the lower portion. They removed a, a garage space and have a parking lot in the back for six cars, I believe. Uh, the upper portion uh, was a residence. Uh, I believe that doctor uh, ran afoul of some, um, some uh, legal issues and is actually part of the federal um, penitentiary system right now. Um, uh, so that pain management is no longer there. There's some talk about a dentist possibly taking the space, but right now uh, it was approved for a, a doctor on the back with parking in the back, um, and that exists uh, immediately to our east. And then the next, uh, the next use coming up to the east is... that is, property for sale? Uh, unfortunately, it's not for sale. Okay. Um, and it's not for lease, actually, at this point. Um, the doctor did look into it. It's not for sale, not for lease. The... Um, the office, uh, the next one at 491 South Orange Avenue is the Institute for Judeo-Christian Christian Studies at Seton Hall. It is a nonprofit foundation. It is an office use. And then finally, uh, the next uh, property up at the corner of Warren Court is actually a residential property that faces, uh, it fronts onto Warren Court and faces Warren Court. So that's a little bit of the, uh, the character of the neighborhood. Obviously, um, the, we think it's important to note that the buildings that face onto South Orange and uh, South Orange Avenue are quasi-residential or non-residential. Again, a home professional office with a significant doctor's office underneath on the on the basement level with parking in the rear. Uh, so it certainly has the feel less of a residential property and more of a commercial property with the rear yard parking area. Um, the doctor's office, which is that easterly portion uh, that has the different character and feel, has a different architectural representation uh, that denotes the different use. Uh, what's nice is that we're actually just sneaking in the rest of that. 
uh, dental office into the rest of that space, unbeknownst to anyone on Elm Court. Mr. Keller, the, uh, the, the last property that you referenced on the corner of Warren Court and South Orange Avenue, mm -hmm. the one on the aerial photograph with the green roof, mm -hmm. yes. isn't that a house? Yeah, I said it's a house. That's and, the one and house. Isn't the front door on South Orange Avenue? You said it was on Warren Court. Um, you know, actually, here it is. I, I guess the yeah. address is Warren Court, and I, I guess I have my notes wrong, but certainly the photograph doesn't lie. Yeah. And I think it's Correct. relatively recent photography. So I, I stand corrected, and I appreciate that. And the house in between that residence and um, the, 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 the building that's in the federal hands right now right that, with the white roof I guess mm -hmm. it's a white house that's that's a that's the Judeo-Christian studies the Institute for Judeo-Christian studies okay. um, so that's a non uh, a not profit off uh, foundation that runs an office I don't actually know what they don't do there um, they're, they're actually, yeah. just an aside they're actually one of the departments of Seton Hall University um, right. they may have created a uh, nonprofit component but it is one of the departments from the university. The university purchased it, uh, I forget how long ago it was, for that specific department. They were in front of us briefly a number of years ago, and yeah. then they withdrew their application. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're um, oh, actually, I seem to remember that. They wanted to put residential living spaces, as I recall. Um, they, uh, I, I was not aware. I, I looked at the ownership roles, and it is not listed as Seton Hall. It's listed as the, as the nonprofit foundation. But, um, certainly, it does have the word Seton Hall in the name. Mr. Keller, if we, if we travel down South Orange Avenue in a westerly, westerly direction, those houses, do you know what they are on the other side of Elm Court? Uh, the other side of Elm Court, I believe, are primarily all residences up to the park, as far as I know. Certainly, um, actually, I, the second residence up on uh, uh, moving west from Elm Court, certainly there's a number of cars parked in it, but I don't, I didn't actually study that intersection. Uh, there's been some road work going on in front of it, so I really didn't study it. But I know the first, at least the, the corner property on, on Elm Court, and the next one in a residential use. My gut instinct is that they're mostly residential uses as you move west uh, until you get to uh, the park about two blocks up. And if you go east? It's more professional buildings. Uh, east, you get you get um, a much bigger mix of re of office buildings, uh, apartment buildings. Uh, the character changes rather quickly yeah, as you move. There's more dentist office over there too. Right? Yeah, there's a uh, there is another dentist office that's just up the block. So you, you start as you move to the uh, east uh, towards the Irvington border. You certainly get a a, a much higher uh, predominance of office buildings, multifamily housing, etc. Uh, very little single family. Um, Keep, you know, South Orange Avenue, obviously we all know in this area, it's a major arterial collector. That's a high volume street. It does provide for, um, for high visibility for traffic. But I think what's also unique about this particular area is we have no neighbors directly across the street. We have Seton Hall University uh, across the street. So in terms of the, uh, I, I think that the building will be attractive from, from South Orange Avenue, but really uh, the primary uh, access and any patient load that would be coming in is coming off South Orange Avenue where you already have um, students walking along, you have joggers, you have people in the university, and you have no residents use just directly across the street from us. The, uh, Mr. Keller, if yes. I may ask um, a question. When you do uh, get into the parking, could you relate the, uh, the uses along South Orange Avenue and how the parking is accommodated on those, particularly to the east, where there are a number of converted residents to office mix? Um, when you get into that, if you could do that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I can speak. Um, I, I studied uh, the subject block a lot more than going further to the east. Um, the, the Seton Hall restrictions drop out as you move to these, so there's more available street parking. But I can certainly, um, I was actually quite surprised when I did the parking study, but I can get into the, the nature of the parking and, and how the parking works for the doctor in concert with the other um, home professional office um, and, uh, um, and the Judeo-Christian studies, how that functions currently. Particularly on-site parking for the other uses as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, as was indicated, um, the applicant proposes to expand the area of the building. To Microphone. 
devoted to the dental practice um, and eliminating that residential use on the, on the property. Um, they obviously will re renovate the entire property, both interior and exterior, and as was indicated, there is no addition to the building. Um, it, re it is really about providing a better experience for both the patients as well as the um, as well as the employees. Just to, uh, you know, we actually tried to get some photographs of the interior of the space and it was very difficult to do so, um, recalling that essentially just a small portion of this right side of the, of the drawing, if we look at A1A, the first drawing of the proposed, um, the proposed plans, the essentially the waiting room is, is virtually unchanged because really the, the doctor is not doing this to substantially um, enlarge his patient load. Did say one of the things that will decongest that is that is that parents can then move back in to be with their children. But essentially, that area is remaining unchanged. What is what is changing is uh, when you come in on the left side, there won't be reams of, of photocopy paper because there's no, no place else to put them. Um, there won't be four patient four uh, lateral two four draw lateral files that hold uh, patient records immediately on the side. Instead of having the reception face into the waiting room where there is little privacy, uh, it will be facing away from um, that area to allow for better privacy. Uh, right now, there's two file cabinets right on top, perched, and I, I use the word carefully, perched on top of that currently is a $90,000 CAD CAM um, system for, um, um, for some of the devices they create. Um, for what? For what? It's a, it's a CAD CAM system for um, creating dental appliances. So there's a... So as the doctor said, you can make crowns on site. It's a rather, it's a two-part system. Um, essentially, it's a, it, 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 uh, you send it through a computer program. Mr. Keller, you, you take an impression. Can, can I make a suggestion? Yes. The board focused on a couple of issues. I'll move to it. During the completeness. They talked about the parking, and obviously you're looking for a use variance here. We know that if you make a larger office, it's going to be better for the practice. But can you translate that into what the zoning variance relief that you're seeking and, ha and how the board should address that, rather not the benefit to the applicant, but the benefit to the, to the township? The, um, essentially, when you look at there are a number of variances re required. Essentially, they boil down to two variances that are, are most appropriate here, or, or we need to consider. One is for parking, and one is for the use itself. This is not a permitted use in the zone. Uh, it's permitted as an accessory use, I'm sorry, as a conditional use with a bunch of conditions, um, but we're really viewing this as a wholly new use within the zone, and we're arguing that it's a, um, it meets the standard for a D1 variance and didn't want to get in the, the confusion of a D3 on uh, uh, non-conforming uh, conditional use. The one other exhibit I'll briefly show just to explain those variances, and this would be A4, I believe. What is it? A4 is, it's a site plan, in which case we uh, have a color superimposition of the zoning setbacks um, as required by the ordinance. And what I wanted to the, the board to understand was that, was that when... Sheet, was that one of the sheets already submitted to the board? It is submitted, however, it has a, has a blue line and a green line that have been added to it. It's sheet two. It is a site plan sheet two, 481 South Orange Avenue site plan. It has the same date of 2-18-2014. As I said, the only difference is we have a green uh, zoning setback line, which is appropriate to a front entrance on South Orange Avenue. And we have a blue setback line, which is appropriate to an entrance off of Elm Court. And the reason we did this is, obviously, when, when the residence was the primary uh, use, the door was facing Elm Court, and the blue line became the setback requirements of a 25-foot front yard, uh, a 16-foot uh, rear yard, um, four-foot side yards on either side. And so the existing building actually is, is fully conforming with the setback requirements, the bulk requirements, um, for a building that would be facing Elm Court within the RA60 zone. It, it's when we give up that access, we make that door no longer operational, and we say now the entire access is off of South Orange Avenue that your, or your ordinance says, now you switch. Now this becomes a front yard, this becomes a rear yard, this becomes a side and a side. So the green line indicates the zoning that uh, we applied in the updated zoning tabulation. And what you'll see is that as a result, we have a side yard uh, offset to Elm Court, which is only four feet, a side yard uh, to the next building up to the east on South Orange Avenue of only four feet, 16 foot to the rear, and 25 foot to the front. So when you see a bunch of uh, variances are required 
for setbacks, it's really because nothing's changing on the site. It's just that when we changed, when we said we're no longer to gonna have Elm Court as an entrance, it's only up South Orange Avenue, that zoning uh, envelope rotates 90 degrees, and then we pick up a number of deviations where we don't meet the front yard setback, we don't meet the rear yard setback. So I wanted the board to understand that while it looks like we have a lot of deviations that are existing non-conformings, they really are existing non-conforming. There's no change, it's just a, it's just a technical, dif uh, technical change in the way the, the property is viewed. There is a frame shed which is over the line uh, in the back that's existed for a number of years. Uh, the doctor keeps a snowblower in there to make sure everything is kept clean if his snow uh, people don't come. Um, and certainly we'd be willing to consider removing that or, or moving it onto property. The, uh, I guess what I'm gonna do first is before I go to the, uh, if I go through briefly, the variance is required. Let me ask one question now. You, you said you were kind of changing the rotation here. I wanna make sure in my mind, for emergency purposes, we not only gonna have one door now. For emergency purposes, mm -hmm. we gonna have more than one more than one door in the building on the first floor. Yeah. There is there is more than one for for yeah. the purpose of emergency. There's three. All right, there are, there are multiple well, doors. You know, I, yeah. I, you know, I just want I know that, but I just wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. No. <coughs> the, it, the the plan has been fully worked to al to allow for the proper amount of egress. There are other egress methods out. Uh, the foyer, uh, the porch will no longer be used, but there is a second means of egress uh, out onto the deck area right, and no, down to the backyard. Again, I just wanted you to state that. Yep. So accordingly, we need uh, variance relief for a front yard setback where 25 feet is required, 15.53 exists um, on the new South Orange Avenue front yard. The, uh, we have an existing non-conforming uh, deviation with regard to uh, the lot width. 110 feet is required, we only have 70 feet. The, uh, we also have a rear yard requirement in the new configuration of 16 feet. Um, to the next property to the north on Elm, we have only 4.51 feet. That's an existing non-conforming condition that we're seeking relief for. Uh, lot coverage does not change. The existing property is at 58%. Um, that's an existing non-conforming condition that uh, is irrespective of the, of the what's the front yard, but it is an existing non-conforming condition that we're not changing or increasing. Um, we also have a setback to the shed. We're actually over the line. We need a variance, an existing non-conforming condition variance for that. Uh, the shed to the principal structure, uh, uh, six, excuse me, uh, shed to principal structure, 20 feet is required, 3.41 uh, feet is, is, uh, is existing. And then the uh, rear yard patio uh, offset, 16 feet is required. Essentially, we're right on the property line at zero. So those are all the variants really for the existing non-conforming conditions. Uh, what really is at the heart of the matter is uh, we need a D use under, under 4055D70D1. We need use variance relief to permit this expansion uh, into the entire proper, into the entire uh, building. And secondly, we need a parking requirement we're based upon the uh, ordinance requirements of five spaces per professional. Again, there's two dentists and two hygienists, and that's what they are limited to. Um, there, that represents um, four licensed professionals, 20 spaces are required, uh, and we calculate there are as many as six spaces uh, available in the driveway, and we can discuss how that works in a moment. But they wouldn't be six legal spaces. No, they wouldn't be. Okay. And again, you know, we're talking about a, a, a business that's been here for 29 years. No, and uh, I'm not arguing. I'm just, yep. I don't want it to be on the record that there's six spaces. Right. They're not, they're not six traditional spaces, and we indicate uh, quite clearly. The, the six works as, um, as two, two side by side uh, and three tandem is the way that they would work. What was interesting is we, we asked the doctor what his, mo his busiest days were of his practice, um, and they were Mondays and Fridays, and they only practice one Saturday a month. So we decided to look at um, what the actual parking was like in the area on a, on a Friday, a Saturday, and a Monday. And we purposely tried to find a week that was not uh, spring break for the kids, it was not um, the, the Jewish holidays, it was not Easter, and classes were still in session, it was pre-exam week. So we really only had one weekend to fit in there. We, we analyzed, we looked at the parking 
uh, in the area. And we essentially broke it into a number of components. And this was based upon um, sort of my, my, my predisposition to how the parking might work on the site. The first thing we looked at is that there's a, the driveway can accommodate as many as six spaces. Next we looked at that area between Elm Court and Warren Court. There were three spaces to the north of the Seton Hall restricted area and there were two spaces to the south of the Seton Hall restricted area. So there are five spaces on the street between Warren Court and Elm Court that were not restricted at any time of the day. There was eight spaces that exist between, um, between the poles uh, that would be restricted to um, Seton Hall students Monday through Friday. And I believe the hours were 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Friday. It's on your photo. Yeah. So that's the, uh, that's the restriction. We also looked at Warren Court because Warren Court, while there's no parking along the, along the easterly side, there is street parking that's, uh, that's available along Elm Court on the westerly side. Uh, until a few years ago, it was actually three-hour parking. About uh, two and a half years ago, it was changed to be one-hour parking, and that is Monday through Friday. And that's actually, contrary to what my report says, it's actually 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. I think the old restriction was three three-hour parking. 9 to 5, but the actual current part restriction for the last couple of years has been the west side. You can park along Elm Court Monday through Friday between the hours of uh, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Um, after that, it's unrestricted. So we looked at a combination. What we did is we started uh, during those three days and we counted the number of cars that were parked, um, irregardless of the use and where they went, the numbers that were of cars that were parked in the uh, Non-SHU designated areas on South Orange Avenue, the designated portion, the parking lot, and Elm Court. And we decided to break, break Elm Court um, from the curb up till probably the um, the end of the first radius as being the southerly portion, and we looked at the rest of Elm Court as being the westerly portion. And we saw that in terms of the available inventory um, in the South Orange Avenue, um, Warren Court to Elm Court, the Restricted parking area, there were eight spaces, unrestricted five. Elm Court uh, in, the, in the south section, that's the it's closest to South Orange Avenue, there were 11 spaces moving all the way up to the intersection of uh, University Court. There were 13 spaces and on site, we said there's as, as parking for as many as six um, vehicles. What we were surprised to see was that the um, very few patients actually park on Elm Court. I was the primary parker most times on Elm Court, and I tried to keep myself out of the survey area, but um, very few patients actually park on Elm Court. And, very, and the, uh, six, what we expected to see uh, as six cars used heavily in the driveway, um, there were never more than three cars. It was generally um, the, the office staff that stayed the longest, often followed by the doctor. Uh, who pulled in deepest, and it left the remaining areas available for patients to park. And we never saw more than one patient parked in that space during the three days we examined it. Um, almost all the patients either parked along South or parked uh, in the spaces along South Orange Avenue. I will say that uh, it would appear that the parking um, in the restricted zone is not much enforced by the by the police. Uh, so some people parked in that area, but I will say there were people who parked and went into the rear of the pain medicine. I don't know what doctor's operating there, but there, was a, there were cars that parked in the street, did not use the parking lot, came to the front door, went around to the rear yard, and went into the doctor's office. There were a few people that visited the Judeo-Christian studies. Um, there were, um, on Saturday, we included lawn maintenance vehicles. We included, uh, there's a, um, a couple cars that I've seen consistently parked out by neighbors on the street. We included all parking. So what we did is we looked at, uh, during the, uh, during the uh, three days we looked at, we looked at the available amount of inventory and the amount of cars were parked in it. Recognizing the total inventory in the total area study was 43 cars and the area uh, without an SHU permit was 35 vehicles. Um, we, provided the, uh, we provided the data, and I'm gonna give you some slightly revised data as well. The busiest days for the dental practice um, were examined, 15 minute periods, and our conclusion was that if you look at the Friday parking counts um, for total available, even total available not using this, the Seton Hall University parking, um, there was never less than 23 spaces available 
um, uh, in the area considered. And there was never more than three cars that were parked on site, two of which were generally the, the dentist and one of the um, staff, and I don't know whether it was a hygienist or not. Um, the, if we look at the Saturday period, uh, that's when we get to use the SHU, SHU parking in the front. So there's a total of, a total of 43 spaces available. Um, we had the 32 spaces was the least amount of availability we had uh, during the hours of 8 a.m. to 12 uh, to 12 noon, when the doctor said he's most of his patients, most of his Saturday patients come in the morning. Uh, Fridays tend to be scattered throughout the day. Uh, Monday tends to be a lot more emergency, a lot more early stuff. That's why Monday is a after the weekend, people come in, they make an appointment, they can, they have a problem they developed over the weekend. So the morning uh, tends to be the busiest on Monday. Those are the three areas we study. Um, our conclusion was that what was interesting, first of all, was that the six car parking in the on the lot was never utilized. Uh, we, we only saw one patient use it that we could clearly identify as a patient. We saw a couple people run in and run back out and leave while they were dropping a check off. Um, but for the most part, there was never more than one patient parked in that park, parking area. And the way they pulled in certainly allowed for adequate use of that, that area. The reality was South Orange Avenue, for this doctor's use, um, provided more than ample parking. What we did is we also did a breakdown. This would be A5. We looked at those three days and I said, let's just take out Elm Court and let's take out the restricted areas and let's look at the same three days. So now um, on Friday, our available inventory was 11 spaces. On the weekend, when we get to use that SHU, we have 19 spaces available and on Monday, we go back to 11. And you can see on the three busiest days of the week, on a typical week, um, there were counting only South Orange Avenue and the on-site parking lot there were never less than six spaces available on Friday. There were never less than 12 spaces available on Saturday and never less than six spaces available on the Monday through their busiest period. So what we, what we saw from this is that uh, A, the existing driveway, um, we sort of, I was a little skeptical when Dr. Roseman said most people don't use it. Uh, it's used occasionally and it can certainly be reserved for handicap or new patients that come for the first time. Um, but most of the, most of the existing uh, staff that doesn't get dropped off or doesn't walk, um, they find adequate parking along South Orange Avenue or the few um, in, in the lot that's on site. The, uh, we saw a number of people who walked um, uh, out of Elm Court or came out of Warren Court and, and walked down into the property. We're really only a block and a half from the Warren School. Uh, we did. Uh, we saw only one person with a Seton Hall sweatshirt walk in. I don't know if they were a student or not, but during the times we observed, uh, we did see a fair amount of people walk in. They would walk down, walk in. Um, we did see other people parking throughout the area, so it wasn't as though we were the only use. Uh, there was certainly some activity uh, at, the, at the medical building to our, uh, immediately to our east. What was surprising was um, we only saw one or two people actually pull in the park and use the lot. Uh, most of them actually parked out in front in the SHU restricted zone and walked into the back, and I don't know why that was, but um, our, our takeaway from all this was that certainly um, given the amount of inventory available on South Orange Avenue, given the nature of the practice, and even allowing for uh, a decent expansion, um, again, recalling the primary purpose is not to expand the practice, but to better, better provide services for existing, existing clientele, um, even a modest improvement could be easily handled within the existing parking available on South Orange Avenue. And then there still is the uh, one hour parking available on Elm Court. Um, my discussions with the parking authority and with the doctor is that uh, South Orange Avenue, especially at the beginning and end of the semester, but certainly throughout the year, they do relatively uh, rigor rigorously and vigorously enforce that one hour parking. So when you've got procedures that take an hour to an hour and a half, Clearly, those patients are not going to be parking in that one-hour zone because they're likely to get a ticket, and if they get a ticket, they're not going to come back. So um, we felt that uh, South Orange Avenue and the availability of parking into that uh, 
um, into the excess area that weren't used by the two uh, employees was really more than adequate to handle the existing needs, and we thought it would adequately handle any expansion that was brought about by the enlarged, um, uh, the enlarged dental space. I would Mr. point Friedman, out, I just did. Is this being offered as A5? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I would. Uh, and A5 is a supplemental parking analysis from Casey and Keller? Yes, it is. And it is the, it's the same days that we reviewed, it just, I decided to take out some of the data. So it's the same days that are reviewed in the parking study that we, that was submitted as part of this application. To, how did you, when you took Alum Court out, how did you get 11 spaces available if there are, or if there are restricted space, eight restricted spaces between Warren and Alum on South Orange Avenue and only five unrestricted, where did you get the 11 We had from? six on site and five on. Six on site and the five on South Orange Avenue. And then you, on the weekends, you add in the eight restricted, which brings up to 19 as your total inventory available. So the total yeah. available is after there are three on site and what, I'm, I'm sorry. It's what, the open, the open spaces left. Uh, I'm assuming it's the open spaces left in case more people came at that yeah. time. It's, it's, easy, it's easy to count the number of cars and then just subtract from the available inventory. So the, <clears throat> after we take out the number of spaces that are taken, what's left over we list as total available. Mr. Mr. Keller, are you, are you done with the parking testimony? Uh, as far as the traffic study, yes. Parking because I'd like to open it up for questions on that before you go into the planning testimony. Sure. Mr. Descala. Yeah, you have a question? No, I was just going to say ask if we could take a break at some point. At some point. Okay. We've only been at it for an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> I, Mr. Chairman, so, I could use a break as well. Okay. Why don't we take a break and then we'll get Mr. Keller questions on the parking. Okay. And then once we're done with the questions on the parking, he'll finish up his planning testimony. Can I borrow your pen real quick? So we'll break for 10 minutes.
is it okay to ask questions? He just gave me the the wave. So okay. we'll reopen the meeting and we're opening for board member questions for Mr. Keller on his testimony regarding parking. Mr. Descala? Yep. So, um, Mr. Keller, I was curious, um, we talked about existing conditions. One of the things that we like to talk about with a site plan or existing and future conditions, you know, build, no build kind of thing. And so, um, we're, we've got a site that looks like it's, it's ripe for an intensive use that isn't being utilized for same. And that's the space that you talked about um, where the pain management um, doctor was. Mm -hmm. um, what do you estimate would be the parking utilization for that site? Have you looked at their, you said they were subject of a variance. Did you look at their variance and see what their parking requirement was there? You know, we started doing some work, work for that client. We didn't finish, and I, I didn't get, I wasn't able to get the variance application as to see the size. I knew that they do have a, they removed a, a garage to allow for six parking spaces down right. in there. I was um, at the site. I saw they do definitely have six striped spaces in and, and a, and a pretty well-conforming setup mm -hmm. uh, with a nice travel lane. And, <coughs> um, it's a much better situation than what this particular site has in that you don't have to back out of the driveway into oncoming traffic. Correct which is, I, I said to you uh, on the side a few moments ago, it, I think is probably the reason that people don't use that, that driveway all that much. Um, so, so you don't have a sense for that, but we do know that we've got um, 11, I'm sorry, 5, 11, yeah, 11 available spaces uh, without Seton Hall um, reserved spots. Correct. And um, I'm curious, do you know, if, have you approached Seton Hall to see if you could have that restriction lifted? No, we didn't. And we know that the Seton Hall is actually is currently creating more on-site parking. Exactly the reason I asked the question. So we right. don't, uh, we, um, we didn't approach the behemoth Seton Hall to see if they would give us parking or they would relent on that or we didn't think we'd get much traction if we did. But I think that uh, increasingly Seton Hall is getting uh, more on-site parking whether that uh, on-site parking restrictions will uh, be relieved in some future date, we couldn't get an, 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 uh, any kind of answer. I know the doctor has spoken to um, the parking authority in town, and they have said essentially it's it's not re it's not enforced, and they don't know if it'll last. But obviously, we can't rely on that, so we just right. included it as not as restricted parking. But even still, uh, it is available on Saturday. Um, even still, we felt that there was adequate parking for the existing user, client user base um, on the street, as well as uh, the doctor's, the doctor's uh, patients. And I think it's also a way that, uh, look, I, I think that the fact that uh, two spaces are taken by the doctor and they're the ones who back out daily and there's the availability for the third person, for the handicapped person, and the third person uh, on site, I think that's also would be something that gives the board a sense of comfort that another practice down the line is not going to take this over. Um, we're also willing to, make, willing to make some restrictions that limit us to the amount of professionals we've indicated in, in our application. So I think that the setup here would be ideal for this doctor, but I think that the parking, the one hour restriction on Elm Court, um, actually will be somewhat self-limiting to this becoming a, a more intensive use by another, by another doctor. Do you, um, know, do you know why they changed the parking restriction on Elm Court? Yeah, when they had the three-hour parking, they were still getting Seton Hall students who were running in for a class and running back. So they were able to eliminate that with the one-hour parking. Um, and okay. it's, uh, uh, the residents seem quite comfortable with it, and it really does restrict. Uh, it's hard to say. I, we all go to the dentist. So we all know, I don't know the last time I got out in less than an hour, even for routine cleaning. It's pretty unlikely. Go to oh, the or, dentist in Manhattan, I'll tell okay. you, you're always out in less than an hour. <laughs> so, um, but at any rate, I, I think that the, the point being that... Uh, uh, Elm Court, we decided to take that out of the study because when we witnessed it, hardly anybody parked down. I never saw more than one. When I w personally witnessed people who parked on Elm Court and went in, uh, it was never more than one car at a time, um, and it was not continually used. It was the, it was the, the furthest space to the south uh, where there are two spaces between the, the no parking sign and the driveway, um, and never more than one space in there. 
uh, Elm Court has basically not utilized all the parking counts that we saw in Elm Court, except right. for that one car that used the dentist occasionally, right. are mostly residents. Yeah, I, I, I hate to see um, a residential street used for commercial parking, so it's good that it's not. I, um, I, so just in terms of raw numbers, you say in your zoning table that, that there's a 20 space requirement, um, not for the existing use, but for the proposed. Correct. Is that correct? And um, of that of that 20 spaces, um, it, it can, including the seat and hall spaces, you're still shy. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I was looking for my notes. I seem to misplace them. I'm sorry, your question was including so there's the 20 spaces required correct. of those available that aren't on Elm Street. Um, you would be shy of that 20 spaces. Yeah, we still wouldn't even, have even we if still you had the spaces, seat and hall, correct. you know, turning over those spaces. For, correct. We still wouldn't have 20 spaces. That's correct. Right. Uh, you're at 18, I think it was the number you said, right? Yeah, 18, including the SHU spaces, uh, 11 plus, uh, let's say it's 19, actually. Which is pretty close. It's not too bad. Yeah. Um, okay. And then um, from a site plan perspective, um, how would you address the, that whole backing out of the driveway issue? Um, right now, I, mean, I, I, I pulled into that driveway today in, in my sleek minivan and uh, got a sense of how many cars could go in that, into that driveway. And, and I pulled out um, and felt like I was taking my life into my hands. But luckily, um, there was no one parked in the space against the curb immediately adjacent to that driveway, um, in which case you can back into that without encroaching into the travel lane uh, much, if at all. Um, is there any way to... to um, broker a deal with, I guess, is this the county? Is this a county road? It is a county road, yes. Um, where they could prohibit parking in that space so that it could be used. Um, it's kind of like what you might, um, might what you might see in a, like a, a hammer configuration for a, you know, an on-site parking lot where somebody can back into it and, and pull out. There, get a, a, maybe a fire lane or? Uh, we could certainly talk to the, the county about about pulling back one space to a little better visibility. Actually, I, I, in the three days I was there, I made probably 35 illegal U-turns um, um, to go from one side of the street to the other. I backed in and out of this. But I would come down South Orange Avenue, I'd back in and back out. Sometimes I walked the whole thing, sometimes I would drive the thing just to get a, a full sense of the area. Um, what I did notice is the, the next, there's a signalized intersection about 1,000 feet uh, to the east that actually provides rather nice gaps in the traffic. Um, you, do get, you, you do get two cars that are coming down. There's some ongoing construction work, so it narrows to one lane uh, just to the west of Elm Court. But there are regular gaps that are created by the signalized intersection. And those gaps mm -hmm. allowed me to make a U-turn um, from the uh, opposite curb, from the southerly curb onto the northerly curb, also allowed me to back up. So there are gaps. Surprising you just, you're, you're saying that publicly, right? Yes, away. I am. <laughs> it's against the law. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but it is, in fact, like a single lane now with parking on the side, because one of the two lanes is utilized by parking. Yeah, they, 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 it's two lanes up ahead. The throttle's down to one, um, and then it opens up to two briefly, but then it goes back to one again. Right. But it's, uh, it, again, I thought the, uh, the signalized intersection providing gaps is what makes that driveway work for backing out. There's no way we can turn around on site. Um, I think even, even removing, you'd have to remove a num a, a, an inordinate amount of cars out of the Seton Hall parking range to allow a completely unrestricted access. But we felt actually between the driveways, uh, again, I've backed out in the gaps. Uh, I've done it a number of times, and we felt that certainly it's any time you back out on the South Orange, Orange Avenue, it's caution. All of those residences do it. Uh, essentially, that's why the doctor and one of their employee park in the back. They pull in once. They may pull out midday. They most likely pull out at the end of the day. So they're pulling in. They're only backing out once, and that's reserved for that additional uh, right. customer. And, and again, there was never more than one patient that we saw parked right at the sure. right at the sidewalk or just on the onside of the property uh, at any of the study times we looked. Okay. And just to, for clarification, so that signalized intersection, is it Center Street? I believe it is Center Street, yeah. Okay. So it's, it's two blocks away, roughly. Yep. Right. Yeah, it's Center Street to the east. Right at the entrance <coughs> of Seton Hall there, mm -hmm. right? Correct. Okay. That's all I have for parking. Okay. Mr. Adler? Just a couple, Mr. Keller. Uh, just generally, how, how were the counts done? Who did the counts and how did they get done? 
Uh, I had one employee that did the accounts for about two hours on a Saturday, gave me a break, but otherwise I did all of the accounts myself. Uh, what I did is I uh, arrived um, at each of the designated times, 8.30, 9 o'clock on the different days, uh, and I took an inventory uh, across the Elm and South Orange Avenue of the numbers <laughs> that were car parked, and, and like clockwork, uh, every time I hit a 15 minute increment, I looked at the amount of cars that were parked on the site in each of the four zones or five zones that I identified, and I just took an inventory. I didn't, I didn't with no prejudice as to whether they were lawn maintenance vehicles, they were visiting a, a, another home, uh, they were uh, <coughs> private parking uh, from uh, Elm Street residents. I just took a snapshot at that second when the, when the, when the you know, that's the great thing about phones these days, they're smarter than we are. When the smartphone clicked and it said uh, 8.15, I just went and I started from one side, generally from where I was parked on the other side of South Orange Avenue. Again, I tried to stay outside the study area so it didn't influence anybody. I double parked across South Orange Avenue, or I parked on the next block, uh, just to the uh, to the west of Elm Court, uh, and then I would take a quick snapshot. I'd look down both. Sometimes I would hop in the car and I would drive down Elm Court, circumnavigate, come back around, um, and then 15 minutes later do it again. Okay. And um, to the extent that there they are parking spaces at all in the driveway, wouldn't how many of them would be forward of the setback line? I think there are, you can still fit, if I grab my scale, forward of the setback line, you've got uh, 50 feet, which means you can fit um, three small cars in there, um, two large cars. If, you're, if, the, if the cars that park in there first park all the way up at the front, uh, the next one parked fairly close, you can certainly fit uh, six on site in just inside the setback line. Larger cars would, would tend to stick out a little more, but again, what we witnessed for the most part was often either the, the back two were the doctor or the two on the left were the doctor and, and a, a, uh, another staff member, and it left the rear approximately 20 feet um, by the full 20 foot width by the full 22 foot width, it allowed for one car to park and then that's all we ever saw parked there was one. But that's in the front yard, isn't it? Um, it's, it's forward of the building, certainly, yeah. But it's, be, it's, it's behind the setback line, but forward of the building, yes. So the, the length of the driveway is, I mean, obviously the setback's 25 feet. The length of the, the overall length of the driveway from, this, from, the, um, from the right away line back to the curb line is, 53 and a half feet. And again, uh, we regularly design, cur when we design curbs like that, uh, we allow for the vehicles can actually overhang by about two feet, the wheels can get up there. So if you wanted to park, um, you would actually have 53, 55 foot of parking surface that you could park in and still not be forward of the right of way line. Between the right of way and the sidewalk, there's another five feet. So between the sidewalk, and the, and the feet, back basically. there's about 60 feet, you lose about five feet. And you can fit three cars on the site, we've seen it. Um, uh, the one day that somebody pulled in, there was the doctor was parked for, uh, there's actually another person arrived before the doctor, I chided him about that. The doctor was next and someone pulled in right behind him. Um, didn't take the opposite space. They ran in, uh, they were only there for a few minutes. I, I suspect paying a bill or making an appointment, came back out and backed out. But they were, uh, there were certainly three cars that were nested in there. I've pulled in there myself with two other cars in there just to make sure it could be done. So you could certainly fit uh, six cars into that parking area. The reality is it was never utilized by more than two, two um, employees slash uh, doctors and one patient. Uh, I wasn't quite finished, but uh, does our ordinance permit parking in the forward of the building line? You know, we're, we're in a residential zone, so the, the ordinance doesn't restrict you from parking in front of your driveway, in front of your garage, etc. cetera. Um, generally, your ordinance restricts against parking in the front yard, yes. This is a, this is a, it's a we're in a residential zone, so it's silent on the RA60 zone. Um, but yeah, in commercial zones, um, there are restrictions about parking in the front yard. For residential properties, generally, if you're pulling in, uh, there's no restriction about parking in that area or if you have a garage, parking between the garage and the street. Can I, can I, can we walk through the, the, um, not the actual load you saw, but, but a kind of build up to a load if, if the office, if the new office design was, 
was used that it's you know used fully. Um, so you know the testimony we have is six six treatment rooms, two admin, two dental assistants, two hygienists, and two dentists. And the testimony we have is that with the expanded facility, uh, the doctor and his wife would potentially both be able to see patients at the same time. When, when you think about that, now you've got eight staff um, and who are there for an extended period of time, can't park on Elm. Where are those people parking? Well, I would point out on, on Fridays, uh, there is an overlap because generally um, Dr. Roseman is in early and his wife comes in and, and takes over from there. So there's a time when they don't see patients together, but they do. I'm asking, I'm asking the, you know, we're being asked to approve uh, a use variance on the, on the site, uh, a use variance that would include six offices, uh, six treatment rooms, and, and space for comfortably running an office with eight, eight people working in it. My question is, where are those people parking? I think that they're, I mean, the doctor's um, anxious. Let me, let me, let me answer. I think Mr. Parlapiano's question is more generically, where are those people yeah, parking? So I if you look forward, if we approved this, and there was now a, a, a building in a residential zone um, that had six treatment rooms plus comfortable space for staff to work on insurance calls and reception, you know, there's a, there's a nice active little office there with certainly eight people in it before we get to patients. To my mind, that says eight cars from, you know, morning, from, you know, when you start to when you close, right? I, I think a couple things. One is I've had the opportunity to work, this is the third dental practice I've worked on in the last year and a half. Um, most recently, a, a home professional office for a dentist in Milburn, where part-time dentist, three days a week, three to four hours a week, new mother, um, and even though it was a relatively small part-time practice, she was lamenting over the fact that she could only have three operatories because for her to offer the type of service that she wanted, she should have four. So I think we do have a, a shift, a paradigm shift in the, in the amount of space and operatories that are needed. As I said, you've got uh, a panoramic x-ray machine that needs its own room, um, and they often go in with, there's a, there's a seat, it's an operatory, but if you've got, you like to keep that open so that it's, it's All I'm going on here right. is not, I'm going on the testimony that said two admin, two dental assistants, two hygienists, and two dentists. Right. That makes eight if the office was fully occupied. Correct. And, and I'm assuming at that point that either you would put six and fill up the driveway, in which case you have a problem with handicapped access or anyone who just needs to be close, or you'd park eight on South Orange Avenue or some combination like that because there aren't a lot of options here. Well, those are the current people that are there. And so, and, and they park now and they don't, and there's been, and our numbers show that there's adequate parking on South Orange Avenue. If we take out Elmcourt completely, there's adequate parking on South Orange Avenue to handle that, 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 back, that, that uh, background parking for both the neighborhood and the existing practice. The doctor's indicated that, you know, he, w he is comfortable limiting it to two, uh, two doctors. Um, and if, if it's expansion, um, actually two hygienists with the possibility of going to a third hygienist, never a fourth hygienist. So essentially, we're talking about um, a relatively, um, a doctor that's willing to limit himself to the number of professionals that we've indicated on the parking, uh, two and two at this time. Um, occasionally, as a, as a consult, a specialist, another dentist may come in, but never more than two names on the, on the sign on the front of the, the building. I think that's somewhat self-limiting. Cur currently, there are eight staff. As indicated, some walk, some get dropped off, some w and, and they specifically are able to hire within the community. So right now, those eight people are there every day, and they park. And so we're talking about the possibility, of, in terms of staff, one or possibly two more staff that might, that may, might be parking and where there's an adequate inventory uh, throughout the day on South Orange Avenue. Um, well, I, think, but, but I think actually that gives the other testimony we've had is that is that with the additional treatment rooms, um, the hygienists could see patients more regularly on their own. There'd be room for that. Well, they never see them on their. Well, they, they see them first. They never see them without the dentist finishing up with them. But you know, the the other factor in that is it, this this is not long term parking. Procedurally, we average about forty five minutes to an hour and a half. So even with the inventory that's available, there's a great degree of turnover, you know, so it's not, 
with other businesses where people are sitting there all day, even in terms of our hygienists well, and what staff? I, what I'm trying to understand is if you use the space to the mat, that, that you're asking for to the maximum, how many full-time staff would, be, would there be there who the, potentially full, all could My full-time staff actually will not change. The, o the only um, change that I anticipate is a part-time insurance person to do additional billing. But in terms of my staffing, I don't anticipate a great deal of change in my staffing. Now, the hours of one of my hygienists would increase because we'd have availability for that. But in terms of my philosophy practice, if you're talking about generically yeah, but I'm not. But I'm not. I, I'm no, no, listen, listen now. It's, it's yeah. very important to understand that the way dentistry is performed now is we do not fill up our rooms and just pile people in. You have to have another room available. As, as Mr. Keller stated earlier, one single doctor in a small home practice wanted four operatories. Because the way pe people, time is, time is everything. Time is everything for everybody. They don't want to sit an hour and a half waiting because you don't have a room available. I told you, emergent care maybe is about 30% of our day. Somebody will call up, a tooth broke, they fell. Things happen. We have to have that availability so that people aren't sitting there two hours. The worst thing is to treat an emergent care person. Now, a patient had a 2 o'clock appointment, and they're sitting at 2.30 because I treated an emergent care person at 2 o'clock. So it's not fair to either person to have the emergent care person waiting or the person that left work early to come for their 2 o'clock appointment and couldn't be seen because there's no availability of the room. So because we have room availability does not mean that we are going to totally utilize that room eight hours a day, if that somewhat answers your question. So even though we have the ability to see an additional person at a time, that is not the way the paradigm of dentistry is being practiced today. People, time, people don't wait. People don't want to wait anymore. If people wait, they leave. I also think that that gives the board, can give the board a comfort level that this, because there are six operatories now, it doesn't mean that, they, that this practice can double in size. Um, government regulations, as well as the available parking. That, like that one hour restriction on Elm, I think Elm Court is critical, because it really means that it's not really viable for, for parking for the dentist. So I think it, it means that it can give the board a comfort level that in the future, this is not going to be attractive. So when Dr. Roseman retires in 30, 40 years and his, and his son doesn't take over the practice um, and they sell it to another person, it's not going to be attractive to a four, a four dentist office. First of all, they're willing to put a restriction that there'll be no more than two dentists on site and limit the number of hygienists. But it's, it's just not going to be viable or attractive to another, another doctor who wants a more intense practice. A, the parking is great for this use, but it wouldn't support a practice that was two or three times this, this, this size. And the parking is not really available on Elm Court. Elm Court that's why we took it out of, the, out of the study. So I think the, in some ways that should give the board a comfort level that what you're approving will work for this, this dentist. And I think we can work out the details on handicap accessibility and a parking space. I don't think that those six spaces are really needed. I think what's needed in, in that parking area is three spaces. So we could certainly create a, a handicap space and space that's behind that for two, um, two employees that would make that work. And we still have available parking. And the dentist has thought long and hard about whether this but will satisfy took, his needs. So let's go with that then. You know, if you, if you did uh, uh, call that driveway three spaces, which would be much more, much more realistic in terms of how it's used and it's what you saw, how many spaces then are there on South Orange Avenue independent of the Seton Hall designated spaces? Well, at the, at the, um, at the worst then, so we're, we're taking... Uh, just, three just spaces a, out of the inventory. So at the at the worst case, um, there was always three spaces available. I don't, I'm not asking that question. I'm asking if there were three spaces in a reconfigured driveway. Correct. And we didn't count the Seton Hall spaces on the street because they're Seton Hall, whether, whether it's enforced or not. There are then only five spaces on South Orange Avenue. Five spaces plus three. Yeah, five external, three inside. So that would give us eight total spaces. Correct. When the testimony we have is that there are, there are eight professionals in the building. No, there are eight employees in the eight building. Employees four, in the four building. Eight employees in the building, right. Um, which seems to say that we're setting ourselves up for a practice that has no room for patients. I think that the essentially the eight staff that we see now are part of this background and they're parking 
um, whether they're taking the, the number 31 bus or I saw them walking onto the site or they're getting dropped off. Yeah, and, I, and I, I understand that. And I'm not, and I, you know, I really do appreciate the time you put into the, the counts and, mm -hmm. and, and your own credibility in this, right? I'm, I'm asking, we're being, we're being asked to approve a, a, a reconfiguration of a building of a certain size, which can potentially generate a certain kind of load. I, I appreciate the idea of two dentists. Um, and and I you know and I appreciate the testimony about the way you run your practice now. But we're being asked to give a variance to allow this building to be used for all time um, as a dental practice with two dentists. And what I'm saying is, as the parking is is laid out, mm -hmm. it just looks to me like there's not enough room there. You know that that almost alleviates your concern about it after I leave and hopefully I'm there for a while because it will be self-limiting to say a corporate minded entity because it isn't attractive because of what you're just stating. So we'll always somewhat conform it to the family style practice just based on the availability of parking and the structure the way it's set up. So that that's one of the things I, I, I want to get across to the board. That's self-limiting to the big chains. They don't want that because of the very things that you're concerned about. Well, that's, inter that's an interesting argument, right? That the, that the lack of parking is itself gives us comfort. Well, not the lack of cop, the availability that, of parking that's available. Well, will, the, the, will, the, will, the, the very limited amount of parking that's conveniently available to the site should give us comfort approving the use variance because it's self-limiting. Well, uh, I, I think again, the, I, uh, the, the paradigm shift is that the practice of this size, it's, it's, it's so antiquated in only having three operatories to service the current patient load. And so you are, you, it worked great for the last 19 years, yep. and yep. what the doctor is proposing will work great for the next 20 years. Um, but it won't work for a larger practice. If he wanted to double his practice, this, this site wouldn't work, and parking would become a limiting factor. But we feel there's eight, there's eight employees now. There may be a ninth employee, or one of the eight employees may stay longer. Essentially, there'd be no additional em employee load to service um, the existing patients and a possible increase of patients. Um, so I think, again, that it is somewhat self-limiting. Parking is a double-edged sword. We think there's adequate for this doctor. We've asked him repeatedly. I didn't actually quite frankly believe him before he did the parking study. And I went out in the parking counts and I was quite shocked. I expected to see more p people using Elm Court. I expected to see six cars in, in the driveway and they were never there. And people always found parking. The, the practice thrives. Um, they say they see 13 to 15 patients a day and maybe they'll go up to 18 a day. Um, so again, we're not talking a huge uh, increase, potential increase, and that, Lack of availability of a, a large expansion is self-limiting, and I think that it means that it will not be a corporate dental office. It will not be a, uh, a four-person office, and we'll, we're certainly willing to restrict ourselves to two names on the, on, the, on the front. Any practice, even a sole practitioner, generally wants to have the availability to have a second dentist for when they transition out of, the, out of their, uh, they usually try to have a one-year overlap where both dentists um, work on, on site, the one that exits and the other takes over the practice. Right. So it's not uncommon to have two dentists the, do the doctor has indicated he will limit them to two dentists, um, basically limit himself to two hygienists, although he'd like the ability to have uh, a third occasionally. Um, two dentists only, occasionally a, a, a specialist may come in for a consult, but again, only two dentists would operate on the site. So I think that those are all self overall limits that this board could, could accept and place on an approval and feel comfortable that they'll work for this doctor. They'll allow this doctor to continue to serve the community that he's served for 19 years in the place that he has, has served it, and it's worked well. He's part of the fabric of the neighborhood at this point. It allowed him to continue doing that with a comfort level that it'll never get out of control when he sells it in 30 or 20 years. Um, that it's gonna be a same family style practice that would be appropriate for this, and no dentist is gonna buy it. Um, in, in a sense, um, the doctor is making, he's really limiting his sales price on this or limiting, limiting the, uh, the number of potential buyers by saying I'm willing to limit myself to the number of doctors and the parking is gonna self-regulate because no doctor who wants to do a highway or a multi-practice is gonna come here because there's simply not enough parking. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify regarding the the parking in the front of the building um, for uh, under 92-202 requirements for one and two family detached resident parkings. paragraph A the last sentence it clearly states 
parking facility shall not encroach upon the front yard or side yard adjoining a street. So in this particular zone, if this was a single family house, you would not be allowed to have parking between um, the building and the street. So that would limit the, the depth of available parking in the existing parking lot. So when it's you, limited by the position of the building. Correct. Not a setback line. It's not the setback line, it's, it's the front yard. And then when you go uh, to uh, chapter uh, 92201, which deals mainly with the parking requirements um, in general under um, paragraph, um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, paragraph D, except for access drives, no off-street parking or loading spaces are permitted between the building line and the street in commercial zones, except for those lots which front on Valley Street in the B2 zone and those lots in the B3 zone where no Wall Street parking or loading space is available. Right. Um, that doesn't really apply to this zone, but that gives it the, the Board of General an idea of even in a commercial zone, you're not supposed to have parking between the, in, in the front yard between the building and the street. So should they be requesting a variance for parking to allow those six spaces? Well, actually, well, the, I, I think they're, in, in uh, the way Mr. Keller just described it, they're looking at really only three practical spaces in that lot now. To identify it as six available spaces in there is questionable. I, I don't know what the distance is actually from the back of the lot to the front corner of the building. Um, I know it was 60 feet out to the uh, property line. Um, so you probably lose about another 10 or 15, 15 feet, I'm guessing. Uh, there's 38 feet from the curb to the front corner of the building. And so you could certainly fit two cars in that 38 foot depth. Yeah, you're limited. At the, Standard parking space is 9 by 18, so um, 38 feet would give you the depth for only two spaces right. in tandem. Um, and then once you incorporate the handicap space requirement, you're, that means it's really only available three spaces if the board approves it that way um, to, to allow the parking. Right, so we'll need to amend their site plan because it says that there are six spaces existing. Um, six, it says six spaces existing, that's the way it, they're using the area, but they're not legal spaces. They're not, they wouldn't be considered legal spaces. And practically speaking, in, in my opinion, the way the driveway is laid out, because there's no drive aisles, there's no turnaround access, there's, no, there's really only two spaces um, in that. Um, I understand the practice and the way they're, they're running it, you know, having employees park in the back and then have people parking behind them, uh, you know, works functionally for them. Um, but practically, it's, legally, it's not really three spaces. It's really only space for two cars because they, they shouldn't be packed, parked in tandem. Another, I have a, so that a more global question for you, and maybe this, Mr. Dwyer, too. Is there anything that would restrict this to a dental use in the future? If it's, if it's approved for a medical use, I mean, can we restrict it to a dental use? Well, didn't we have this question in the other building down the street? We got into this, and mm -hmm. it was, seems like... Whether or not there was a distinction under the code with respect to professional office as opposed to op general office space? There, um, there, there is a distinction in the um, code, especially when it comes to parking, office space right. versus medical dental space. Medical dental space is lumped together, um, and it's... Uh, one for 300 square feet of net floor area for spaces for the examining rooms, the, the doctor's offices, the um, waiting rooms, um, that's how you would calculate it, or five spaces for each professional. And that would include uh, the doctors, the tech technicians, and, um, and uh, paraprofessionals, they call them, which, are, which would be. Is that a, whichever is greater kind of? Yeah, whichever or, or, is or, greater. Or, right, yes. okay. So, so I guess it, my, my question is, I think also getting to maybe a little bit what Mr. Paul Piano was saying is that f future, I mean, th this may work perfect for the doctor now. What, what happens? Well, there's, the, there's what, there's. what, 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 what do we have to restrict it for being, to being perfect for the next guy? Well, th there's a number of considerations you, you, you have to take into account. Um, the, you can put conditions on the approval, you know, limiting it to a certain number of professionals. Um, but again, the conditions like that are very difficult to enforce. Right. Then it becomes an enforcement standpoint. 
um, you know, there, there aren't inspectors going out and going in and counting the number of professionals in, you know, in the offices to determine how that works. Um, the other consideration, too, is when you're relying on street parking, public parking, all right, today there's no restriction, you know, from the limit of the seat hall parking to the corner. Um, that could change. You know, yes, Seton Hall is expanding and creating more parking on campus. There may be a reduction in the need for their street parking. Um, but there may also be other improvements in the area. There may be other changes in the area. Elm Court's a perfect example. There's one hour parking on Elm Court for a reason. Um, and that was established. So th there's, there may be even, uh, you know, the Board of Trustees may make a change that, al that limits the time for parking on South Orange Avenue sometime in the future, which would... Well, and at a minimum, South Orange, public parking is a shared resource, and so there are other uh, buildings there, right? We're not, we're not here to designate all of available parking for one building. Right. Um, so, so it could change. So today there may be those spaces available in front of the building, but that could change because it, you know, it's a public space, and, and the applicant would have no control over that. I mean, they could speak out and, you know, be against it, but the reality is that could change. So when you're looking at the parking variants, I don't think it's, it's so much a, a six-space parking lot. I think it's more, practically speaking, legally two spaces. Um, you know, you could use three or possibly four if you're really squeezing them tight. Um, the law does require the ADA space, and I think as we sp spoke before, I think you have, do have to consider accessibility into the front of the building. I think that's something that you, know, you do need to consider. And then there was uh, one other question, too, regarding the interior improvements. Is there a requirement, and I know the architect isn't here, but is there a requirement for the upstairs, now that that will be office space um, in a medical use, is there a requirement for accessibility, um, you know, some sort of a yes. lift? To get to the second floor in order to use that space. Yeah, that that I am certain of. I don't. I, I'm not an expert on ADA, but I have reviewed it enough. Um, just took my uh, my continuing education credits for engineering. I took an ADA course. Um, no, the second floor would not be required to be AD, uh, accessible. Um, you would have to make it accessible to patrons, um, not to all employees necessarily. So the first floor would the be the only part that would would that could have a requirement, and I'm not sure that it does fully, but could have a requirement or a partial requirement for ADA accessibility, but the second floor would not. I, I don't want to uh, get in an argument with you about that, but I would disagree with that 100%. That $110 I spent was all for nothing, huh? Okay. Yes. One class is not an expert. Right? But I'll, I'll that's look, not part of a zoning application. I'll look tonight, but at, at any rate, obviously, um, it's can not I, something we, we thought we'll look into. Can I ask a question? As I'm looking at um, the board planner's report about parking space, and it talks about the number of square feet and the number of parking spaces required under the ordinance. And I know you testified that for approximately 1,520 square feet would be the total number of square feet. That's if, the net. If, if, it's for, if the application were approved. Correct. Okay. And how many square feet are there now? Uh, 760. And the 1,520 includes both floors? Uh, it, it includes the, um, it does not include the second floor. It's the first floor uh, area available to patrons, reception area, bathrooms. I don't believe it includes the second floor. Is there any parking needed for the, the second the floor? Ordinance, the ordinance does require office space to be included. So the second floor, I believe it's designated by the architect and the architectural drawing that there is the doctor's office space up there. Mm -hmm. And I think there's another. Um, administrative office up there. So that square footage should be included in the calculation of, of the net as well. Either way, I, I don't, I, I did not prepare that portion of the, of the document myself. Uh, it was prepared by a partner and his, and his assistant. But I think even if you, uh, I'm looking at it, I'm seeing 760 and I'm saying together this can't be more than 1550, 1520, so it did not include the second floor. If you included, you wouldn't include the lounge area, but you'd include the office area, you'd still be less than the uh, requirement based upon professionals. Yeah, the professionals would be the dictating uh, factor Correct. in this case. It would be the more. Um, and then the question regarding the number of professionals, um, the, 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 um, the, the two dentists, the um, hygienists, uh, you're, there are two currently, um, but they are part-time. All right, so um, 
I think the board can consider that as a single, you know, if they're not, if they don't work basically the same time, you could consider that as, as one single professional for this practice. But uh, if you're talking about adding another, so you're looking at one, two, three, four professionals at this point, but there are also technicians, uh, uh, correct, that, that work here? They're, yes, sir, dental assistants, yes. Yeah, two, two technicians, okay. They're, all, they're also counted. <coughs> So now you're now you're up to basically six professionals, which I, I wasn't aware that the dental assistants were licensed professionals by the they're DCA. They're not licensed professionals. They're, right. they're dental, and they're not always there at the same time. It's just a matter of based on our schedule. Yeah, but the the, the ordinance says um, dentist, paraprofessional, or technician. So even if you know they're not licensed, they they would be considered you know, a paraprofessional or a technician in that regard. And it would be five for each of them. So I think you're up to, you're up to five, uh, you're up above five. I think you're around six now. 30 um, spaces. So you're looking at a requirement of 30 spaces, um, which is significant, I, you know, and understanding that some of the technicians may fluctuate some, you know, they don't work the same hours or things like that. I think what the board has to consider is that you know at your peak time, your practice, how many people can be working in this office at any given time, and then taking it a step further, um, as was discussed before, what happens, you know, after, you know, the the, the practice changes hands and we have a, a new um, new practice there, what limitations or restrictions or conditions would the board have to put on this in order to control, you know. Overuse of the property without the significant, without sufficient parking available. Yeah, based upon the application we did for a gynecologist on Valley Street, I had in my notes in the ordinance that it, that uh, they had to have some form of license or certificate. Um, what defines a technician is somewhat vague, so I, I look to that. But if, but if if the definition is that a dental assistant who you know marks down which which molars need fillings but don't doesn't actually participate in any kind of procedure, if that's still considered a technician and a parking, then, then obviously we need to amend the application. Uh, I thought the spirit of it was licensed professionals or technicians that would actually be independently engaging with a patient, and a technician never does. So based on my other notes, I may have misunderstood that, but if we need to amend it, we would amend it. Can I ask you a somewhat rookie question, if I could call it that? Um, we're being asked to give a variance on one of these rules regarding parking. So I just want to understand a little bit about it. How, why would the regulatory body come conclude five spaces per one professional? I'm, I don't, I, I, like I'm just not able to justify to myself how five, four people could visit one professional at the same time. So like I said, I feel like it's a rookie question, but it, it, I want to logic it. I believe it takes into consideration not just the professional, but clerical staff, reception, receptionists, um, you know, and then patients on top of that. Um, so it, it it anticipates you know more than just you know an office with just a single you know doctor working in that office or single professional working in that office. But it, they would it, it takes into consideration consideration parking for staff, employees, um, and then also patients coming in. So, so if the if the, and again, I'm just trying to make sense of this, the rule, if the staff for the dentist is the dental technician, and the dental technician is the lowest on the totem pole with respect to providing the professional service, then why would, we, why would the regulatory body say that the technician themselves also needs to have allocated space for their own staff when they don't really have any below them, so to speak. By staff, it's not necessarily the hygienists or anything, it's, or the technicians. By staff, it's the clerical support. Okay, so the admin, it gives more uh, turnover opportunity. Right. Okay. Now, in a, in a practice like this, there's less likely to be as many clerical staff, you know, in, in a small practice. Larger practices, yeah, you'll, you'll have more, you know, staff working, you know, on a regular basis. Okay. In a situation like this, which is something the board can consider, you know, in, in this, that you know, most likely the, you're not going to you're not going to have, you know, a secretary for you know for the for for every the doctor technician. technician yeah. You know, but I do want to just to go back to the point I was making before, and I, I I pose it as a question again, which is, you know, if if there are eight staff on site, if they're seeing two patients 
three patients an hour, I don't know, you know, if you have two dentists, I'm assuming two, maybe there's a third person in that hour. That would suggest to me that it would be eight plus two or three, plus at the turnover of those two or three patients, the person might come a little early and might have some, so you, you might wind up with eight plus three plus three, you know, you, something like that, right, would be, if you were gonna do a bottom up, I'd be sitting here saying, I, I need to be really comfortable that I can park 14, right? But you don't have that. And, and, and that's why I'm, I, I'm not disputing what you counted, but I'm saying in an office that now has six, uh, six rooms, um, where the testimony is eight, eight staff people working, now you know the doctor's wife can can work at the same time comfortably it's going to add a little load you put the patients in at a rate of 12 to 18 a day a couple an hour it adds up to that right now and and maybe they're all walking but we're being asked to approve that level of activity so even independent of the times five and everything else to me there's a bottom-up build here that says we need to be comfortable you can put 14 cars in, a, in close proximity to this site with a reasonable belief that over time they're not going to go away, they're not going to be competed for by Seton Hall or by another building or by a neighbor, 14 spaces would start to make me feel like, okay, we've got, our, we've got a reasonable plan here. And, and yet what we have, at best, if you occupy all of South Orange Avenue and put three in the driveway is eight. Microphone. And, and his and his feeling has continually been that I don't have any parking problem now, and I, I can expand by 10 percent. That I get patients who walk in uh, in the morning and they walk to the train. That I get people that drop off. That that yep. it's worked. And and I was a little surprised and, and doubtful, and the numbers seem to bear that out. That they can handle what's currently. That they can handle a moderate expansion, um, and basically have some of the part timers that are there there longer, or maybe overlap, yep. and still meet that need. Uh, and again, I know it sounds a little bizarre, but it's the one thing that sort of limits this from, from getting out of control. It, it's worked. The doctor obviously wouldn't be investing this kind of money if he wasn't uh, convinced that the parking on South Orange Avenue could help him. Now, keep in mind, you're right, we don't have any control over the parking, so it could change, but we have to look at what's there today. But if, if, if the parking got out of hand where, where this doctor was overwhelmed in the neighborhood, similarly, the town could change the parking and make it more restrictive and essentially terminate the business. So the, the town yeah. does have the ability to have some control. We can't control the future, but the town can actually if they find that it's a problem. Certainly, we hope that over time with Seton Hall adding parking that they'll, they'll release some of those, those uh, restrictions in front. But even with those restrictions, the doctor, and he can certainly say because we've asked him this, no less than 10 times over the last two years we've been talking about this, um, that he's sure that this, that this expansion will accommodate his needs, his future needs, and the primary purpose for this and the number of operatories and the number of spaces are really there to give, provide the quality of, of dental care that he should be providing to his existing patient load. Right. I, I think that um, one thing that's probably missing is the understanding of the modern day dental office. I have a client in um, Bud Lake, Schwartz and Cohen, 20 chairs. And you would believe that with 20 chairs, man, they would need a million parking spots. But the chairs are basically in and out. The more chairs I've seen in dentist offices, it's faster work because the folks are not waiting. They get you prepared, the dentist runs around in an office, it's gone even in Melbourne. I think you might probably be familiar with, um, with Dr. Zuzu's office, Suburban, Harry Dentist. They got about 12 chairs. So I think that um, I understand what the dentist is trying to do. If the chairs doesn't indicate people, people sitting there, it's just efficiency. You also have to keep in mind that, that if, a, if a more delicate procedure is done, it sometimes takes a half an hour to sterilize a room. Now they are they are centralizing their equipment, so that goes out of the room. But even the room, um, I did I did a doctor uh, Dr. Gershinsky in the Maplewood Milburn border, who has at least twelve operatories, um, and um, again he has a parking lot, but it's relatively empty because even with those twelve, the type of specialized dentistry that he does is such that 
there's a there's a low turnover rate um, there's actually um, those rooms take an hour to clean because they do very delicate mercury work and so there isn't there isn't an automatic relationship as, as Mr. Semper was saying between the number of operatories and because we're doubling the amount of operatories it has nothing to do with the this this operation doubling in size, it's really bringing it up to current standards. I'm, I'm gonna ask my question again, and then I'll leave it there, but again, uh, I'm basing my simple math that got me to the, to the number on the testimony, which is eight staff seeing 12 to 18 patients a day, which means probably two to three an hour. We currently never have eight staff at one time. They asked me the total number of employees that I have. At one time, we max out at six currently. We never have eight at one time. The question was, what's the total number of employees right, you have? Right, so it's not eight full-time employees. So okay. we've max. But, but even six. at six, my, my point is, I, 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 I'm not disputing the as-is count at all. But we are being asked to approve a use for the site. And, and so even with the, you know, the, the low turnover, even with all these things, if you kept up with 18 patients a day, you know, you're going to need more parking than you've got in your count, than you found available today, right? And, and I, don't know how to, I, I don't know how to get around that as a, not as a today issue, not the way you run your practice, but what we're being asked to approve is forever. I just, I have, uh, I have three comments. Number one, I haven't heard testimony. I know we've been focused on the parking, and that clearly is a key consideration for the negative criteria impact that's, on that's the neighborhood. The next thing. Um, I still haven't heard about the, other than the pain center, the adjoining um, properties that are used for some type of office use and what their parking situation is. Um, the other part is the negative criteria as it relates to its impact on the master plan and the zoning ordinance. And then obviously the positive criteria with the special reasons. Well, he hasn't, so, we haven't gotten into the planning testimony. This was strictly the, we were, we're dealing with the, tra the parking testimony. I, I recognize that, but yeah. I think that these other pieces are, will fit into that discussion, and I would be very curious to hear how that is, the, so Mr. the testimony Mr. Keller, is related to that. Can you offer any um, information regarding the on-site parking on the properties immediately to the <laughs> east, yes. heading up South Orange Avenue towards center? Um, I could just throw a little piece in there. Uh, the Judeo-Christian Center is really low traffic, and they have parking in the rear of their building, as well as a pain management facility. They have parking in the rear of their ability, their building. Further down the block, um, I think the, the last home after that is a re residential. And as you go further down, uh, further towards, uh, I'm not sure, east-west. Uh, towards the entrance of Seton Hall, you have another professional space with parking. Um, Seton Hall has acquired another building, and they have their own parking. There is another professional practice that has <coughs> their own parking on site in the rear of their building. So the parking load is not significant as you go further in that direction because most of the practices, businesses, either either related to Seton Hall or private professional practices have on-site parking. You know, we don't know whether that parking is, is sufficient for you know, what, the, what the code requires, whether it meets that requirement. I will say, if you look at the drawing, you can see that uh, uh, there's a garage, there's two cars parked behind the Judea Christian Study Center. Um, if you cross over uh, Warren Court, you can see there are large driveways uh, into the back. The second building in um, has a uh, parking lot of at least, uh, looks like about 12 cars. The next building has a parking lot that's probably got 15 cars in it. And then there's an, uh, uh, the, you can see the portion of, a, of an apartment building that goes beyond that that has parking on site. So you can see that this is to the west of us is primarily residential. We don't, I don't know of any home professional offices in that area or office buildings. 
our block is the one that is um, has two home professional offices or what were home professional offices the, the office building for the for the uh, Seton Hall uh, use and as you move um, as you move continue east almost all of these buildings then have self-contained parking lots during the entire time I watched parking not at one point did I ever see anyone park um, between Warren Court and Elm Court and walk further to the east so any of the cars that parked uh, on this street um, almost all of them um, either came across the street to South Orange to, to Seton Hall or they came up to, uh, to the doctor's office or they came to the pain management center. Again, I saw a number of cars that parked in front, went in the back, but never used their parking. Certainly as uh, there is expansion, there's room to park six cars behind that building. So I think we're somewhat unique in that there is adequate, uh, adequate on-site parking as you move to the east, to the west is primarily residential, and we're in that block between that really acts as its own um, micro um, cosm of, of, the, of the neighborhood where we, we s there's enough parking in this area to satisfy the needs, the low intensity use that's part of uh, Seton Hall. And again, if that's a department in Seton Hall, it means that you, you would likely have students that are going to be coming across and using that. I wasn't aware as a part of Seton Hall. I know it's in the name, but um, so certainly that parking requirement for the, for the Judeo Christian Studies can be handled in the parking behind or as part of the university again, six spaces next door. So I think that, again, we're somewhat unique on this property in that um, there, aren't, and there aren't many spaces that are going to load on South Orange Avenue, and everything to the east of us seems to have adequate on-site parking, or at least is adequate enough that we didn't see any parking, uh, any users coming up into this area. I guess, um, if I may note, just a different um, consideration that the board may want to consider, that the nature of the commercial uses along South Orange Avenue are they have um, fairly significant on-site parking. It may not be conforming with the ordinance, but most of the commercial, the office along there, have on-site parking that, that uh, at least we've heard some testimony that some of it works in a much better circulation pattern. So, Any other questions that. specifically related to the parking? I'd like to have Mr. Keller continue with his planning testimony. As a um, as a youth variance, uh, the youth standard would apply here, and that says we need to advance the, as as meeting the positive criteria. Um, we can advance the purpose of the land use act, but we specifically need to show that the site is particularly suited. For um, we think that there is a long history of this. Um, being used as a dental office, both for 60 years as a dental office, but 19 years by this, um, by this provider. Um, South Orange Dental has provided services to the neighborhood and, surma and, and surrounding community that can walk to the site. It employs uh, employees that um, also can walk to the site, take public tra transportation, or come out of the downtown and can be easily dropped off. Um, uh, half of the practice is devoted to adolescent dental within walking distance of the, and I would note that we are within walking distance of the Marshall uh, Elementary School. Uh, we are also on a list of emergency providers to Seton Hall University so that students uh, who have a dental emergency can't wait to get home can come right across the street. Um, it's, it's perfectly located for that. Uh, South Orange Avenue is somewhat unique in that it is a high, um, a high volume arterial collector street. It is not necessarily um, while there is residential, um, it is high volume and it is not always most appropriate for residential. And so therefore, um, this nature of the, of the, uh, the building that, that uh, appears to be residential and facing Elm Court with a, with a professional entrance on South Orange Avenue is particularly suited to this sort of uh, uh, family care, um, patient-oriented dental practice. Uh, it's really not suited to a larger dental practice, but it's perfectly suited to this one. The, um, the, uh, I would say if this, if this was a, you know, if this was a home professional office that was mid-block in Elm Court, uh, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here for an expansion. I think actually a permitted mid-block home professional office would have a negative impact on the neighborhood where I think that uh, this being on the corner and accessing all traffic off of South Orange Avenue, uh, I really see no negative impacts. Um, we think that there is adequate parking on South Orange Avenue, uh, even with the SHU restrictions and within the existing driveway. Um, which we agree is actually more appropriate for three spots. Um, overflow can be accommodated onto Elm Court for one hour parking. Um, it's, fairly, it's fairly regulated, uh, but it can be used for short, for short accommodations. 
Um, we think that the site is particularly suited for the continued use by this dentist. Um, the type of practice he has provided to the community for the last 19 years. We think that promotes general welfare. We think that uh, bringing, allowing him to bring his practice up to current privacy standards uh, also advances uh, the general welfare uh, of the community, which is a purpose of the Land Use Act under 55 D2. We also think that uh, we're providing a sufficient space in, the, in appropriate uh, locations um, for a needed use. The dental practice in this neighborhood uh, hasn't been there for 19 years because it's not a needed use. It fulfills a need within the community, providing both for residents of the community to walk in as well as South Orange, uh, Short Hill, sorry, uh, Seton Hall University students. And we feel that the application certainly promotes uh, a, a better aesthetic environment. Clearly the doctor is not going to is not going to let the building fall apart, but um, the building will be significantly uh, painted, spruced up. Um, if the doctor was not allowed to expand and was forced to relocate, um, it's an odd duck of a building. I'm not sure that it would find an immediate buyer, which means that the likelihood is that this would sit on the market for many years and would possibly become fallow and, and, and fall into misuse. Um, and certainly, uh, we think that we are being respectful of the historic um, community around us by um, by keeping the residential nature of the building uh, that fronts on Elm Court, maintaining that historic preservation had no comment because they felt that we were basically not causing any, any harm to the historic district. So we think we are conserving a historic district and a, and a historic building within that district. Um, with regard to the negative criteria, it's a two-pronged criteria. One is that uh, there's no substantial detriment to the, to the public, and the other is there's no substantial impairment to the intent and purpose of the zone plan and zoning ordinance. Um, with regard to... Uh, with regard to the public, um, we think that the principal element here is parking, and we think that there is adequate parking. The dentist has thought about it long and hard. We think that there will be no negative impact on the Elm Court residents, that that's left basically the kind of sleepy uh, residential street that, that uh, connects from South Orange Avenue up into the Marshall School. We think that the, uh, uh, the South Orange Avenue can certainly handle the volume of traffic, the drop-off, the people walking to the site can be adequately handled. We see no negative um, no negative impact. We think that uh, there's really only good. The doctor is clearly an asset within the community sponsoring Little League. Um, uh, that level of, of patient care um, has kept his South Orange uh, clients, his Maplewood clients, his West Orange clients um, as third and fourth generation users. Uh, again, allowing better services uh, to accommodate his current patients and to accommodate his, uh, his uh, uh, employees as well. With regard to the uh, to the intent and purpose of the master plan. Uh, I think that, gosh, I need to, where's Ms. Price? May 23rd. Okay. <clears throat> I, uh, I printed out the, uh, the 2011 update to the master plan. I had the 2006 re-examination. I've gone through the original master plan. Um, Ms. Gruel um, actually provided um, some of the elements of the master plan that were identified with objectives relevant to this application and uh, they are to provide, uh, to protect the, the village's stable, diverse and attractive residential neighborhoods, which we think this does. I think the residential neighborhood uh, is essentially um, focused on Elm Court and I think we're very protective of that. Um, we actually are maintaining the same residential appearance, the same sort of small practice, home professional <laughs> appearance on South Orange Avenue that always exists. So I don't think that we're contrary in any way to that, uh, that uh, goal of the master plan. To maintain the established primarily residential character of the village, again, we, we're not changing. We are, the, we are the character of the neighborhood and we're not looking at a large expansion here. We're looking at basically allowing the doctor to provide the level of services that his clients uh, uh, deserve. Uh, to preserve and protect the unique character of, e of, of each of the village's many residential neighborhoods, including but not limited to those with uh, distinct architectural historic character. Uh, we have not changing the primary historic structure at all. We're only improving it, painting it, fixing up uh, uh, gutters, etc. And uh, lastly, to provide economically viable commercial areas which provide a range of community businesses and service activities. And again, we think that this, uh, this does just that. It provides um, uh, a viable uh, dental practice in an area where it's needed, situation between a residential neighborhood, a school, um, and Seton Hall University. We think it's, it is an appropriate use and it, it actually uh, provides the appropriate level of commercial um, 
uh, practice in an area on South Orange Avenue where it can be accommodated to support the surrounding neighborhoods. So I don't see that we're really cutting against any of the purposes of the Land Use Act. Um, we think that the, the project is, um, as we said, allows a longstanding member of the community to continue his practice, to continue serving the patients that have seen him for four generations without forcing him to relocate out of the community. And also by him staying there will allow uh, this building to be uh, renovated, rejuvenated, spruced up, uh, and continue to be an appropriate part of the historic uh, community. With regard to the parking variance, that's really a C1 variance where uh, there isn't enough room for us to provide parking. The, uh, the standard with the C1 is the shape of the property uh, or the size of the property or the location of the lawfully existing structures thereon. If, if they create a hardship in, in meeting the ordinance, uh, that can meet the positive criteria. We actually have a fully developed site. We don't want to try to create additional parking, create turnarounds. Um, there is no ability for us to create a parking lot for this dentist's office. We'd have to re completely remove the building to fit it in. But what uh, when we look at the the, uh, the negative criteria, uh, again, substantial detriment to the public good and detriment to the intent and purpose of the, uh, the zone plan and zoning ordinance. Again, we think that there is, between the way that this practice is used, um, there is adequate parking for both the employees, uh, the current patient load, and any minor expansion that may occur. And again, we think that's actually a positive because uh, the, if, the, if a more intense user were to move in, they would not be able, they really couldn't meet the parkings. At some point, it would be exceeded. Uh, we think that there is a positive associated with the, the parking variance uh, that's requested. Again, we see that it doesn't cut across any of the purposes of your land use zone. Uh, we think it meets both the positive and negative criteria uh, under C1 for support of the variance for the parking. We think that uh, certainly this is a, uh, you are approving an expansion that will, that will um, uh, live for a long time, we hope, um, in this dentist. But I think that the restrictions that the dentist has put on and the number of professionals that will occupy it, uh, remember if, if another professional wanted to add a third professional uh, dentist on there, they'd have to come back to this board for an additional parking variance and substantiate it. Um, if they added uh, other professionals, again, that parking uh, number would change. It is a question of enforcement, but these things do get around. A third, a third name goes up on this, one of the members of this board or somebody in the town is going to recognize that there's a third dentist that gets applied here in, in some distance, in some time, and they can say, hey, is that appropriate? Or if the parking starts to overwhelm the neighborhood, the parking authority will talk to the, to the uh, governing body and they'll change some parking <laughs> restrictions. So I think that there are controls that are both implicit with this board, um, explicit with this board, and implicit within the community that will control uh, the growth of this in the future. We think it's a good application. It meets both the positive and negative criteria for the D variance and the C variances. Questions from Mr. Keller on his testimony. Why don't we start with Ms. Gruel? This, um, this is in along South Orange Avenue, the frontage. Permits professional office as a conditional use, but must have residential. Correct. What I've heard the testimony to be doesn't necessarily distinguish your parcel, particular suitability from any of the parcels along South Orange Avenue as it relates to professional office. Can you be a little bit more explicit about why this site in particular? Because we all know that professional office with a resident in a residence or with residential is a permitted use, mm -hmm. conditional use. So, well, in terms of in terms of this particular site, I, I think that um, it's particular site suitability, not necessarily unique. It doesn't have to be the only one in the neighborhood that would support it, but it's particularly suited for the proposed use. And I think you make the you can make the argument that uh, uh, this block is different from blocks to the west or the east, and then we and then we hone in on this property. And so I think this block um, has some on-site parking for a home professional office, has um, another uh, office use that clearly meets its parking demand, and then we've got um, a user, a long-standing long user um, that is really um, not competing significantly within this block for other parking. So I think that the site is, is unique to this block, and this block is unique to the blocks around it. I think, you know, conversely, you are correct. This could be a 
a permitted conditional use with a bunch of conditions. Um, if, this were, if this were smaller and someone was living there, um, it would be a conditional use. And the standard we look for in a conditional use is does the site continue to be appropriate for the conditional use despite or, or notwithstanding the deviations from the, uh, from the conditions. And I think, again, you have in here, um, this practice really, unfortunately, the nature of dentistry has sort of outlived the notion that you can do it as a home professional practice, as a home practice, because it needs more spatial requirements, it needs more dental uh, operatories. And so the site is still a part, the, the use as a dentist's office in the neighborhood is still an appropriate one, and that's why it's a permitted conditional use. But in this particular case, we don't meet any of those, and we didn't argue it as a D3 variance, but I think you can, you can find that the governing body said it's not inappropriate to have dental offices in the area, but you need to look at conditions as, so that it doesn't overwhelm the neighborhood. And I don't think this overwhelms the neighborhood. I don't dispute any, anything, any testimony regarding the dental practice and the need for that at all, and I understand that. I'm, I'm relating it to the zoning and the planning testimony and the basis for providing that, that um, variance. So that's where I'm questioning it. And it's for up to the board to decide what that is. But that's where, that's the distinction. So I, I do appreciate it and I'm not questioning any of the testimony on the, the dental needs as such and the operations. So please do not okay. think I'm disputing that as such. But I think when you, when you have a, when you have a, a practice that's thrived in the neighborhood for 19 years, I think that that inherently implies that there's some particular site suitability. This works particularly well for this use. That's, it's a professional office. Again, it's a professional office in a zone that permits professional office it's, if it's within with a residence. So to the, I'm, I'm just talking about the need for planning testimony to provide the basis for any potential D variance. Well, and, and I, think we've, I think we've shown particular site suitability. I think to what we looked at long and hard is when we looked at trying to keep, um, a, we tried to keep a, a small living room facing Elm Court and create um, a kitchen on the second floor so we could keep some mix that was more consistent with the, with the ordinance. We felt, A, it didn't provide the, the doctor with the spaces he needed, and secondly, we actually thought it was an over-intensification. So we actually dropped any pretense of trying to do a combined residential and dental use because the dental just needs too much space to properly treat uh, patients with this, this day and age, with this level of governmental, re governmental regulations. Um, it was too much, and so to add, to keep residential was really inappropriate. So what we did is we kept it, making sure it looks residential, feels residential, um, and to anyone in Elm Court will seem to be residential, and we've expanded into that area. So we're not a combined use. It's clearly a D1 use. It's a, it's a new use, uh, but we think it meets the standard that this site uh, is particularly suited for this, for this type of practice at this location, and that uh, it also advances other purposes of the Land Use Act and essentially does no harm to the, in, to the intent and purpose of the, land, of the master plan in the 2011 um, re-examination. I don't think we really uh, harm any of those purposes of the act. And then finally, we don't see any negative to the public because I think the parking can be accommodated. And the parking was the one we were primarily concerned about. We could talk about moving the shed. The shed was an existing uh, encroachment. Certainly we can get rid of the, the snowblower and get rid of that. Um, we actually, the doctor was kind of concerned having lived on the site for a number of years as to whether a fence was appropriate to go uh, as a buffer between the adjacent properties because he thinks it's actually contrary to the character of the neighborhood. But we're, we're not opposed to putting fences up, additional landscaping, um, any of the other comments that are, are nested within your, in your report. We can certainly go over this item by item. But we actually think that uh, uh, this board can find comfort that it, it meets the negative, the positive and the negative criteria for both the D and the C variants. One question about your, your comment that maintaining the residential character on, on, on Elm Court um, supports the, the, the master plan. The, the intent of the plan is not the appearance of, of residential, it is residential. Um, and so you're maintaining the character, the, the look of residential, but without the residential aspect of, of 
lights on, activity, neighbors watching out for neighbors from a public safety point of view. Uh, it, you know, I think your I, I think your point is is a pretty limited point in terms of supporting the zone because it only supports the the uh, the master plan um, in appearance. It doesn't support it in the real in in the character that the plan is looking for residential character. But I think on, on the corner, it's more appropriate. And I'm not going to use I'm not going to imply this is a transitional lot by definition. But but as a, as a corner lot. I think that um, this can do that double duty. It will still have it will still have activity, have activity in the morning, the evening. Lights will go on, lights will go off. Um, it's not like we're creating a power substation in the mid block and we're making it look like a house that's so never going to be a house. Um, there still will be activity centered around it, um, Saturday mornings, etc. And I think because of its location, again, if we were mid block, I wouldn't we wouldn't be having this the same discussion. But I think it changes the equation when it's on the corner and it's it's. Being good to the neighborhood is that it doesn't cut against any of those purposes of, of the Land Use Act. Um, and I think that that's because, again, it's that it's that um, turns that corner, and I keep wanting to say transition, but it keeps, turns that corner from South Orange Avenue in that makes that appropriate for this use. And it's, but it's not a dead building. It's not a ventilator shaft. It's not a, it's not a dead building. There certainly will be activity that is not contrary. But it's not to a the, residential building. No, but, it's, but I think that the activity will not be contrary to that, to the nature of Elk Court. Other questions, Mr. Adler? One, I, I thought you were going to address the that resolution of six twenty one seventy six. What's it here for? What does it say? Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, it it says it's the last thing that we have, and it says that the residential portion of the premises should be occupied as a residence by the owner to preserve and maintain the integrity of the residential portion of the subject premises. Correct. So, so that, was an that was an application for essentially a home professional office. Right. Um, and, well, we and requested that information. <laughs> so I, I understand. I don't, I don't think they submitted it in, in support of their application. I think they submitted it because we asked them to. Well, well we asked, them, we asked to, them We wanted to know what it said. Right. We, and we wanted to know what it said because in the application, there was a, a, a Part of a judgment or Correct. some all sorts of legal papers that didn't tell us anything. Correct. I thought, and so we asked them for this, and it says that the premises should. Well, we be now know that there was an application to put the medical office in that the board of adjustment approved, that the board of trustees rejected, that was then overturned because the applicant sued the town. But you're right; it was an application for essentially a home office. Right. Except with the exception was that what, what, what separated this is that the, the dental office did not have to be operated by the resident. Right. That so was stricken in the second resolution. By Correct. The court. Right. right. There, was, okay. there was a restriction that said that the previous doctor had to reside in the house. Correct. Which is consistent with the whole professional use. Right. That it, no, that it was the previous doctor, not the, the right. doctor. And the one who died. The, right. the variant, the, yeah, the variant is only good as long as they did. Right, and it, and, it, and it tied, the original tied it to specifically Margaret Fish, had to be living in, in the residence and, and, the, and had to be maintained as a residence. And when they corrected it, they said that the, uh, um, essentially that another, a non-related person could live, could operate uh, versus live there, but they had to maintain the residential portion as a residential use. All right, so in effect, you're asking us to um, erase that previous resolution. Well, it's a different application. I don't, I don't know right. what, what was presented. Superseded. I don't know the ordinance is in effect. So we're, we're viewing this not as an expansion of an existing non-conforming use. We're saying this is a wholly new use that can stand on its own merits. And we don't know what was presented back then. There's not a, we didn't have the great documents we do now. So I don't know how this came about, what the particulars were, what the presentation was. And to me, it's not necessarily germane because we have a new application. We're asking you just to view it on its own merits. Other questions for Mr. Keller? Mr. Randa? I, I have one. And, and, and it was something you said as in your planning testimony, but it does relate back to the parking, and it just struck me. <clears throat> the building is now has a component of this, has a smaller version of what we're going to have if, if we approve this. You have two staff, two dental assistants, two hygienists, one full-time dentist, one part-time dentist. 
what you've said is that the employees, that list of employees is essentially still going to be there, maybe with a slight increase. So realistically, are, are we going from, I guess what I'm getting at is the parking variance is based on 20 spaces required because there's two doctors and two dental assistants. Isn't that what the parking requirement would be now? Actually, it would be more intensive because you had the residents there as well. Right. So, so what I'm asking is, are they, are, do they really need a variance for the parking? Because is it different when it's a conditional use part of a residence? Uh, yes. Okay. They, they do need a parking variance. Um, they, the this the, the prior resolution, you know, the, was done prior to the ordinance right. establishing the conditional use for a professional office in the home. Okay, and all right. So this is a completely new variance, uh, new use variance. So looking at the parking requirements, yeah, they are considerably under uh, what would be required. Okay. All right. Well, I think you bring up a good point. In that currently, if, if this, if Dr. Roseman did not drop this application, stay the way it is, we have the same employee count, but we'd also have the two car parking requirement for the residents that would be additive. So in, in technically, um, we're doing away with the parking where the two cars that would be required for the dwelling um, as a part of this application. It's a technicality. We didn't want to get into that whole thing of, of, you know, comparing what exists to what's proposed. We wanted to be a little more on the conservative side and say, well, this is the number of professionals, this is what we need. But again, I think that what we're really looking at is the actual use pattern, which is, again, these, these numbers, um, to Ms. Zwerin's comment earlier, these numbers are empirical numbers that they look at uh, a range of dental practices and derive it down to a number of parking spaces per, um, per employee. When you get down to the, to, the, to the very large or the very small, the ends of those empirical data, um, they don't always mirror reality. And so we look more to the actual parking counts, which I think uh, justify that uh, the parking demand can be met contrary to what the ordinance may tell us. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I'll open it to the public. Questions for Mr. Keller? None seen. We'll close it to the public. Mr. Friedland, final, final statement, summation? <clears throat> I don't think I can surpass what Mr. Keller just testified to us. We'll, we'll rest on, on his testimony. Okay. So now I'll open it to the public for any comments general on anything on this application. None seen, I'll close it to the public. And now it's open to discussion of the board. Who wants to start? Ms. Ware. I'm awfully, I'm awfully chatty today. Yes. Um, I'm not sure really what it means, but I took note of some information. Mm -hmm. He had mentioned that there's 1,800 patients, and I think people go about once a year to the dentist, right? Assuming that's 50 weeks of working, that's really 7.2 patients a day. And I know he said that he sees more than that, and I believe him. But I think it's also probative to consider the fact that 30% of the business is emergency business. And that emergency business, based on the specific location of this practice, is most likely walkable. Now, I don't know that we all walk to the dentist when we have an emergency, but I think given the information that's been provided, it's reasonable to believe that because of the physical location relative to Seton Hall and relative to schools and where children are, and the fact that he's representing a particular need is because of the emergency use, I think that, it's, I think that it lends credibility to the, to the walk of these other surrounding things lend credibility to the fact that it's a more of a walkable business than maybe your average dentist might be. And that's just one thing um, I thought about. Um, I think it's also uh, something that I take into consideration with this application is knowing that they can't come before us again, asking for more parking. There's no place for them to put more parking. There's mo no way for them to create a more intensive use internally and need more parking. I know that we've talked about before when considering applications whether or not we're gonna see them again asking for something else because it turns out they use it differently than they represent. Um, I also have a question regarding the restriction of two professionals and whether that relates to dentists, what a professional is, is the, do we need to consider 
when contemplating the application, the conditions of the professional extending beyond just the dentist and going to the hygienist as well, and if that's dentist only, or does that mean also lawyers or whatever other professionals are considered? Um, and that's all I really wanted to note. Good. Uh, just a question. I think Marshall School is K to two, unless somebody tells me I'm wrong. Those, um, it's been a while like, since I had kids. Right, there. Yeah, they're not going to walk to the dentist. They're not walking to the dentist. They're going to have an entourage. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But, Maybe see in hall. But actually, their regular patients are likely to walk to the dentist, not the emergency patients. So maybe you had it backward. No, I mean I thought maybe the emergency because see in hall students, if they're having emergency teeth issues. Oh yeah, see in hall. I think that the see. I think if I, if I was across the street from a dentist and in college and needed to go to a dentist, okay. I would walk to that dentist. And I think it's a. There's quite a population there. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's not to be ignored, for sure. I don't think the testimony was that a lot of his patients are, are Seton Hall students. There was uh, no, but he said it was emergency. Yeah. So okay. the, the general year after year returning may be not Seton Hall students, but if 30% of the practice is emergency, then I mean, maybe they're not Seton Hall emergencies. I don't know, but they're on the emergency call list, so I guess. I think it's a good point that, that a lot of the, a lot of the, their customer base um, can and do walk. I think that's reasonable. I mean, they're right adjacent to a, a residential neighborhood. They're adjacent to a lot of professional practices. I, I happen to go to a dentist near where I work. It doesn't happen to be in South Orange, but but um, it's within a 20-minute walk of where I work. So it's, I don't think it's so uncommon for people to do that. Mr. Bree, a few things. Um, a few things. One, um, I also did the math, <laughs> and it, it did seem, you know, I did it in various ways. If they did, if they saw 20 patients a day, because maybe some people go more than once. And I mean, no matter how you do the math, with the 1,800 uh, patients, they're not seeing a whole lot of pay. I mean, you know, the, the 12 to 15 patients sounds about right to me. Um, also, based upon my own experience with my own dentist, the multiple chairs also sounds right to me. I get stuck in a chair and maybe the dental hygienist works on you while the dentist is elsewhere, or, or you sit there for half an hour while you're waiting to, for the next procedure. So that made sense to me as well. And the other thing that I, I, I the more I thought about it in my own experience with dentists and, and the testimony, is the reality is you are in a dentist's office longer than you're in uh, typically in a, in, a, in a doctor's office. So it is a less intensive use, I thought. So again, I, I was, I think they do have very little parking here, but I, I actually don't think they need all that much parking is, is where I came out on that issue. Well, um, I'm gonna go back to my math and, and just, you know, I, nothing theoretical about this, right? 12 to 18 patients a day, a little bit of overlap between when people show up and leave, you know, uh, eight staff leads to a parking load of uh, 14 spaces, right? Which isn't anywhere near what the zone, what what the zone, what the ordinance seems to require, but it's still a lot more than they have. I trust the the numbers um, uh, from the parking study. I'm not I'm not doubting them, but I but we're being asked to approve this site for use that you can easily see if it stays as a dentist and it stays at the, the, the nature of modern use. You know, it's not gonna have six patients a time, not every room is full, but two to three patients, a little bit of overlap when they come and they go and eight people working there needs 14 spaces at some point, right? People, assuming people are driving and you know, maybe a few people walk or live locally, but it's a lot more than there is, right? And I, so, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not so concerned about the five per professional, and the, whether it's 20 or whether it's 30, but I am concerned about 14 spaces that they don't have. Um, and, and I am, I, I, I kind of like the argument about the self-limiting nature of the site, but I also kind of don't like it. And, and the reason I don't like it is it, it sets up a win-lose situation where there's competition for scarce resources. And yeah, you could say that if the competition 
got fierce, you know, if another business opened, if another use opened, if someone else started using these spaces, that, well, the practice would just go out of business, or you could say something else is going to happen, right? People are going to park somewhere because, you know, this is their doctor, and they want to see their doctor. And, and, and we're, we're setting up a situation where it's not black or white. If the spaces aren't there, patients aren't going to instantly transition to a new doctor. They're probably going to try to still find a way to go see their doctor. Um, and they're going to compete for resources. And we see what happens when people compete for resources in that neighborhood. We had that case, we had the testimony last time about what happens when Seton Hall students are competing for resources. They, they park illegally, uh, it generates uh, a, a lot of traffic, and a lot of bad things happen when people are doing that, right? And, and so, on the one hand, I, I, you know, I'm kind of intrigued by that argument that, that the, 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 the limit on parking naturally limits the size of the practice. But it isn't that simple, right? It actually will tend to generate competition for resources, and that can, that can be uh, a bad thing for the neighborhood. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that the resources they're relying on are shared resources. It's not only for them. Despite what's you know, going on in the rest of the block right now, things change, and, and they are shared resources. Um, so you know, that's the part that really sticks in my craw, because this is, an, this is a forever use variance. Um, for for this location, I do think there's a strong positive, uh, and I and I think it was presented. I think uh, it, this doctor has been in the neighborhood for a lot of years, has a strong customer base, has a strong repeat customer base. The nature of dentistry has changed, and it's really tough to keep a tiny little office going any longer. And there's a strong argument to say we we want dentists to stay in the neighborhood. We want local offices. Uh, the zone allows it for that reason because it's seen as a positive part of of a residential zone to have certain services in the in the zone, but the nature of uh, of dentistry has changed and it may be difficult to sustain a 50 percent of first floor floor area being sufficient for a dentist any longer. So I I, I think there is a, a, you know there is a positive case here. But I, but I also think, you know, we, we need to be careful about this parking problem. There is a, there is a, unless someone can tell me why my eight plus three plus three is crazy, we're setting up a parking problem here. Well, it's interesting. I mean, Mr. Don kind of gave a counter to that by saying that's kind of what they're doing now. And, and if it is, and, and, they're, and they're operating in a way that's, that's not creating a problem, then that could be a counter. Um, the only thing that that argument doesn't really address is the, the, the space that's underutilized immediately next door. There's a, there's a that, that pain management space, and I, I'm not, I don't really understand it. At one point, it sounded like it's not being used at all, and then at other points, it sounds like people are going in and out of there. So I'm not sure the extent that it is being utilized. If it's, if it's not being utilized, and 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 it and it needs more spaces than it has. And, in the future when it is utilized. There could be some strain on parking, but it also, the one thing that we're not considering when we're saying that there's no spaces available is that Elm Street's still there. And so that is an overflow. Well, the testimony has been that the one hour restriction on Elm Street makes it not very useful for, it's not, it's not useful for the staff, and it's more, it's, you're risking a ticket if you use it as a patient. At least for the dental use, because yeah, they're there sure typically for more than an hour. Right. The one, the one with, you know, I don't strongly disagree with your 14, but I, I, I do a little bit disagree with it. And, and based upon the testimony we've heard, putting aside that the testimony has been that they only have one, a couple, two or three people that actually park, if us, we assume that eight people do park, I mean, frankly, if I own the place, the way I would have the parking is the way they park you in, let's say, a New York City lot. I mean, you know, they'd stuff you all, I'd stuff my employees all in with no room in between them, back to back, parked in. And um, you'd get actually, even though they're not legal parking spaces, you'd have plenty of room to park several cars there. I don't remember, I don't know how many, but if you're literally parked, you know, bumper to bumper essentially, with no worry about getting them out because they're not leaving until the office closes all at the same time, um, you'd have space for them. And then, you know, you, you don't end up, you know, 
needing the 14 that you've talked about, you need somewhat fewer. I, I don't, I don't want to say exactly how many, but I, I do think it's actually fewer. Well, they, their, their testimony is that there are six spaces, or the application says there are six spaces in the driveway um, if you tandem park them. Um, the typical space is nine by 18. Right. No, uh, but, if you're, but if you're kind of bumper to bumper, it's not going to be that kind of space. Um, if you've got three of my minivans <laughs> in there, that's all you're going to get, you know. <laughs> but, um, but also not, not allowing parking um, beyond the front of the building line really limits that to four at the most. And, and even if we required that um, as a condition that, that all employees must park <laughs> Um, I mean that, that might be a way around that to make sure that less space on the street is addressed. I think the big out is if, if Seton Hall, you know, frees up those limited spaces, those eight spaces on the street. Yeah, but I, well, but I'm, I'm going to go back to, um, uh, to, to, to Sal's point, which is that the, one of the problems with relying so heavily on street parking is it's fickle. Right? It could be that Seton Hall frees up those spaces. It could be they don't. It could be that the town chooses to change the, the way they did at Elm, the availability of parking. Right? That's the problem with street parking, as when it's, in this case, it is, it is the, you know, it, it, it's, it's the way they can park patients. Well, you know, when, when I read through this application and went to the site, I, I was, I, I just knew this was going to be a difficult application. Oh, yeah. um, and I was hoping that there would be some testimony that would crystallize it for me, that it would make it a much simpler application. But uh, I understand what Mr. Parlapiano is saying, and, and I, I, I worry very much not about this user at all, no. but I worry about the next guy. That's right. And I do think that the fact that this user is here now and has a history in the town does carry some weight with me. And I think as, I think the fact that this dentist is existing here in a building that has no residential component because it's not occupied and essentially has the staff that he's going to have and is, is, is operating tells me that that particular user even in this expanded configuration, will probably work in this location, given the parking and the, uh, the availability of spaces. Now, I know I'm, I'm risking the fickleness of the parking, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm risking who might, walk, who might be in there later, but I, I think my feeling is, and I've been back and forth on this in my mind during these last three hours, is I think on balance, I, I, think, I think it's not a bad use for this property, this particular use. I do worry about the future, but for this particular use, I, I think that this is not an unreasonable use for this property. Well, I, I agree with, with you, Bill, that you want Dr. Rosamond to be there if you can do it without worrying about the future. This is exactly the kind of practice that you want, exactly who you want in your community. Uh, but to, to Sal's point that parking on South Orange Avenue could change, and if you look at A1 on the right side on the main level floor plan, it's very easy to move that reception area up towards the top of the page very easy, have a bigger waiting room, and just have a more intense use in the future. Um, I'm not disagreeing. Yeah. And, so, I, and I'm saying I, that I've, weigh, I've weighed that in my mind, and I, I still think that we could craft a resolution that could put some limitations on that, whether it's the number of doctors, the number of hygienists. I have a list of things here. Um, but you know, you you get right down to it. We can't control what someone's going to do in the future. But I think that there's functional realities that if the next user is a dentist, he's not pushing people in and out of the office like a um, like a dermatologist. 
who basically bangs people in and out every 20 minutes. Well, what it, depends, if it's a it depends on the dentist. I mean, mm. ostensibly, if you have 1,800 patients in, in, in 750 square feet, you could have 3,600 patients in 15, you know, 1,500. Scorpio, I've had painful, no, not with regular, painful not realities with in the last two years of dentists, and and I, I will tell you that oh, because it's new. you don't move that quickly in and out of a dentist's office unless you're just getting sutures out. I mean, if you're getting a procedure, they are, if you're getting cleaning, that takes a certain amount of time. If you're getting a procedure, they gotta numb you up. You gotta wait for the numbing to take effect. Then they gotta hammer away at you for a while, and, and then you've gotta. Regain consciousness so you can drive home. So I'm, it, I'm it's very not, blessed in that regard. Yeah. I have no idea what any of that's all about. So give it time. <laughs> all right. All right. Wait so. a few more years, right? So, um, well, let me. So, so, what you're suggesting is a is, and I, and I agree, 100 percent that we want to keep this doctor in the neighborhood. Right. And the nature of dentistry has changed, and it's difficult to do that in a home office of a, few, of a number of hundred square feet. I think that's that's a reality. I, what you're suggesting is that you think there are ways to put restrictions in the resolution in the use that will give us a better level of protection for the future. In the past, we've struggled with we've struggled right. with that, right? And, and and I think that's where the the question was, you know, you know, with with uh, Susan and Sal about how, how do we do that? We really have struggled in the past that having given a use. Uh, medical office use. It, it's a pretty open door, um, and I think we've come to the conclusion in the past that it, that we can't put lots of very specific restrictions in the resolution. It wouldn't be very effective, I would think. Well, that's a, well, I, what, I guess my question is, can we restrict it to a dental office? Ordinance distinguishes between dentists, doctors, architects, professional. I think that Dr. Roseman began by telling us that he works in South Orange and lives in West Orange. <coughs> and in my mind, I'm saying when he looked at probably the, <coughs> the renovation costs, could have also considered, you know what, why do I need to be in South Orange? Why not move to West Orange? Why do I not move somewhere else where I may not have a restriction? I think that's one thing that we should look at. I think I do not have a problem with the configuration because dentistry of the future of today is so incredible. Dentists. Dentists are not even leaving their office. A guy sends an image to another guy and he looks at it and he sends his patient and he says, go see this, go see this doctor, and it's done. I think it's, um, it's a technological age we live in and the configuration that is being asked of us is, is the reality. You go to any dentist office, in fact, I could, in fact, we, we worked on one some time ago, um, Dr. Singer. If you, go to, if you go to a shop, one man shop, he has like four chairs in there. Four chairs, one guy. He has an oral surgeon. And he's an oral surgeon, one guy yeah. on Valley. Yeah. Two blocks down is Dr. Christian. One doctor of about six or seven chairs. Uh, so I, so I, I think that that should not scare us at all. I think what that does, it promotes efficiency, quick turn around, get out of here. So I have no problem with what this doctor wants to do. You know, the, um, it, for me, I think what, from, a, from a planning perspective, if you um, drive down the street from, from the Newark side um, and you take a look at the uses that you encounter um, every single step along the way, there's, there are no residences. Um, all the uses are far more intensive than a residential use. The, the only time you encounter a residential use is actually after you get past this property, right. and it's and it's rather abrupt, right? And so, so I don't I don't think that it's um, it's stepping beyond um, our purview to to say that that we think that it's okay for this 
this single property <coughs> to be consistent with all the other properties um, that are east of that intersection. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but well, it's... you're wrong. I mean, it, it's not, you know, the properties, the testimony has been the properties heading east are home office, uh, office in a home, uh, there's a few of those. We have we have the Jay Christian well, building, which is the only office. There's a home office or office in a home nominally and immediately adjacent, but if, if you look right. at that, that's not, there's nothing that speaks residential there at all. I mean, there's, there's looks like there's multiple doctor's names there. It, it calls itself a you know, professional building. <laughs> so, so but I, there may be others, but I haven't heard any testimony about others, and I certainly didn't see any as I drove down the street. And so, I, so the, the question, that question about whether I'm wrong, I'll take your word for it, but the, but the. Well, I mean, the testimony was that there are, the, the other uses on the block are office and a home, or a pure residential. Yeah, but the residential is all west. Right. No, the, 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 the house on the corner of South Central, house on the corner. South Central Street. Right. Okay, so we have one house. Okay. As you get closer to the corner of it's south not, of Center Street, then you have buildings this, that are totally. This is, this is a residential. The green right. roof building is the little, that's the little old house. Um, and those, those multi-story, it looks like there's a six-story cluster of buildings on the corner of. That's, yeah, that's a Seton Hall apartment building, I think. Okay. And the, the building adjacent to that with the 15 car <coughs> Parking right. spaces, that's not a residence. No, there's no residence there. And so, so we're talking about a couple of residences, perhaps, um, in a stretch of, of <coughs> 10 properties. So it's 80% non-residential. And so I, I don't know, it may, be, it may be stepping beyond our bounds to, to say. It is. It is? Yeah, because yes. it, 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 you're, you're almost talking about zoning changes. That's right. You know, right. Amendments to the zoning ordinance. Um, for this particular area based on what may have been approved or what may have been pre-existing. Um, so I, I, you know, looking at the neighboring properties and what may be an office in a home or right. maybe may apartment building around the corner, um, I don't think is something. Right. That That's why Mr. Keller kept dancing around but refusing to say the word transitional, I guess, right? Okay. Does anyone have a mind to make a motion? Well, I, I want to hear more about okay. the extent to which we could restrict. I mean, that's to well, me. Well, I have, I have a list. I have a list here. I, I said, and, <coughs> and the biggest thing is, I'd like to restrict it to a dental practice limited to two doctors and two full-time hygienists. So, Mr. But I, Dwyer, I, can we do that? Well, I, you know, if you look under the definition of professional person in the ordinance, it says physician, dentist, engineer, architect, lawyer, and any other professional persons as the approving authority may determine. So I'm not sure we can limit it but only I'm, to one type of professional person. So That's what are important. the options? Doctors, lawyers, <coughs> what else? Physician, dentist, engineer, architect, lawyer, and other professional persons. <coughs> oh, it doesn't say anything about that. I know. And we got right, right to this, and, and the problem was we, we didn't convince ourselves last time, as I remember, that we could Restrict it in a way that was sustainable. Right? You could put it down. You could, you could do any one resolution, but I but I think our conclusion last time was that it wouldn't stand up. Well, it was also a little different because <laughs> it was that administrative office for a home health agent. home health yeah. agent. Right. Yeah, right. I mean there was actually no. It wasn't even a professional. Right, right. And it just one more thing: is it two full-time hygienists or that the new regulations require two hygienists per dentist? Limited. Well, that they allow uh, for the maximum. Oh, maximum. Right. you guys can't. Make sure you, you're talking. You, you in. can't talk, or you have to use a microphone. Yeah. One or the other. So, but that, I was the. I mean, I was saying the equivalent of two full-time hygienists. Now they may not be there full-time, but. I mean, I had d dental practice limited to two doctors, two hygienists. I, I'd like to limit it to four parking spaces on site because I think six is not realistic. Um, I'd like to see there be a handicap space, and I'd like to see there be handicap <coughs> access to that first floor. I'd like to see the shed removed. And I have a note here about fence around the parking area, especially abutting the property on Elm Court. Right, so a lot of, but, a lot of those conditions have nothing to do with no. that. 
you know, the intensity, the use per se. Correct. I, I happen to agree with. I, I don't necessarily care about the shed, but the but the handicap parking and the handicap accessibility, whether it be a ramp or or change in grade um, going up to the door, um, would be you know appropriate. But um, I you know I'd be happy to, to agree to conditions about number of professionals and in the facility. I mean, it just we have to come to some reasonable conclusion of why <coughs> we're granting the variance. Well, if you look at it in terms of the parking requirements, it really talks about professional and paraprofessionals <coughs> under 201. So if we're talking about whether or not professional use can be used, if you, want, if you look at the parking requirement, it has to do with five for each doctor, dentist, paraprofessional, or technician. So you could, if that's something that the board is thinking about professionally, I would say that you limit, limit the number of professionals as well as the paraprofessionals. That way you're trying to at least fit within the parking requirement. Now, are those, do I, those? I don't ask me where a paraprofessional is. It's not, no, it's well, not defined in the ordinance. No, well, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to logic what it is. I would think that if there's a limitation based on the amount of them, that it, it might also reference the fact whether or not they could work independently. Whether one, they have employees that work under them and would relate, that their existence would relate to an administrative support volume. And two, whether they could work independently. And maybe, I mean, it's not defined, but we have to figure out how we're gonna, how so we're gonna I look at we it. Should look at that. We have to, we have to, <laughs> you know, look through the ambiguity and come to something together, what we think it means. I think much what you might want to consider is limiting it to two professionals and then and then limiting the number of total employees and doing, That's a good it, idea. Yeah. And doing it yeah. that way. Say that again? Limiting, limiting it to two professionals and then also limiting the total number of employees that can be in the building. Um, Doing it that way, then you don't have to worry about the, the, the definition of a paraprofessional technician or clerical staff or worry about any, any of those areas. Because, you know, again, um, you know, we're getting away from a condition, it's not a conditional use issue or anything like that, and it's a, it's a parking variance. The parking calculation would be based on those, but you're, you know. But wouldn't it matter depending on how many dental hygienists? Let's say there were four dental hygienists, that would be plus two dentists, wouldn't that be six <coughs> times five then? So I'm just looking up in the Merriam-Webster dictionary here, if you bear with me. A paraprofessional is a, is, a, is a person who assists a professional person. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, you know, for example, um, a teacher or a doctor. So they don't necessarily have to be professional themselves. And so I think Mr. Renda's suggestion is a very good one. <coughs> Limit the number of employees, um, but that's not what the parking ordinance speaks about. It's based on professional, paraprofessional technicians. The other consideration uh, would be to look at the um, the requirements for the conditional use for a professional office in the home, because that you know, based on the the ordinance and, and the plan, that was what was anticipated for this zoning district. Um, you know, we're going a step behind that, but you may want to look towards that for the restrictions. And if you get to that, it's, uh, it's, it's, in, our, it's in our memo. Yeah, it's 92-214. It's in our memo. Uh, I mean, some of, it is, some of it is not relevant to the discussion, but some of it may be. or some of it a variation on the theme <coughs> as such. Well, if you considered a professional, says, someone who is- Related to the office shall be on the street. I know, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, someone who is a, it requires certification to be so-called a professional. Um, and the and the applicant has already said that they don't have more than two doctors on premises at any time. Then you could, in fact, just limit it to two professionals. I think a hygienist is a paraprofessional. No. I think they need to be licensed, though, don't they? I don't think so. 
dental hygienist that's licensed? Yep. Oh, they do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. I know some people breaking the law. On that. Yes, they are. So we, we'd be happy with uh, two professional, two dentists or two professionals and uh, two licensed paraprofessionals. There we go. So, Pat, what's the answer? Can we do it? Can I you limit it to, to dentists or not? I, I, I don't know. I don't think that you could restrict it to dentists. I think no. the, the variance is professional office as defined under the ordinance, which includes lawyers and doctors and dentists. And, and dermatologists. <coughs> dermatologists. But you could limit the number of professionals and paraprofessionals and technicians, which would cap the parking. Oh. Seems like a reason. Well, solution. in addition, and then total the limit on total staff, too, because if if it changes over to a different profession. Right. Um, we have to be generic enough that it could be a different profession. Yeah, right. but, yeah but you also want to limit the number of right. employees that you're going to have in that. Two, two that, attorneys, two paralegals. That would, I would assume, be right. at any, the limitations would apply to any given time. Right. Right, because what if you have four dentists in there, but two work two days a week, and then two work another two days a week? Mm -hmm. So I think we would need to, you know, to describe mm -hmm. that with a little bit more detail. If All right, so it's two full-time professionals or the equivalent thereof, right. two paraprofessionals, whether they're licensed or technicians, full-time or the equivalent thereof, and no more than the total number of employees <laughs> valid what? Eight. That's what he was saying. Eight. Does eight work? Would eight work? <coughs> So that's that's two professionals, two power professionals, and and I would eight and four. employees. No, 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 total, total of eight. Total of eight. Total. So including four. total of eight. Including the professionals. Totals, right. Yes. Yeah. Right, that, and that I would. I, I I don't agree with the idea of two professionals at any given time, right. being the restriction. I think it should just be two professionals. If okay. they, you know, the if if it changes, they can always come back to this board and ask for. No, I think that's good because the, yeah. because there's no way to regulate or restrict that. I mean, I right. to enforce detailed, it, you're not right. going to, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to go there and say, Doctor A left, Doctor B's in, Doctor C's <laughs> coming later. You know, we can't do that kind of enforcement. Yep, makes sense. Now, one of the um, one of the conditions are is uh, is limiting the hours of operation so that it's not on. I mean, what I've heard is the testimony that it's not at night correct doctor Sorry, it's not at night you Hours will not be no, no. not at night and one Saturday and one Saturday right. a month our, our Saturday hours uh, are from 830 to 1230 so even a half a day what's your latest appointment during the week 630 well that's at night though that's so yeah. hour and a half then they'll be done at eight well the the current professional and office um, our restrictions, the condition there is um, hours of operation shall not be before 8 a.m. and not after 9 p.m. Monday through Saturday exclusive of holidays. So, but, so that's, yeah. but that doesn't apply to this application unless you include uh, that. We'll have none it, of the, we'll none have the conditions it, yeah. in a conditional right. use will apply to this application because it's Fine. a use variance. So, so we can add That's it. why we, we directed you to those because you may want to take a look at those conditional conditions for the conditional use. The guidelines. As guidelines for the conditions you want to place on this application. Because even though it's, it's a, a use variance, it's still in the residential district and the application is geared towards a professional office in the residential zone. Would it be too general to just say you must comply with all the conditions of a conditional use? You, you, you can't, no. No. because you, it doesn't comply with those conditions. If no. it did, it would So we would have to have a specific hours of operation. So you should, you should right. put the specific conditions in Eight this to nine. approval. And I just, we just wanted to refer you to that section to show what was in mind, what the, you know, the governing body had in mind when this ordinance was created to allow offices in, in residential zones. So we're saying eight to nine, Monday through Saturday? Is that what if we're that's saying? what we want, that's what's in there now. I mean, you can, you can we adjust can that. It. You can change that. <coughs> I'm just saying, as a, as a guideline, that's something you want to refer to. I mean, it seems reasonable. It's kind of vaguely what he's doing now, because I figure his last appointment at 6.30. It's 9 o'clock. He must sometimes go till 8.30 or so. so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's reasonable. 
I could see less on Saturday, but I don't have a strong feeling about it. You know, the other, the other um, uh, line we went down last time we tried to do this was asking ourselves whether we were, in fact, spot zoning. Uh, whether, in fact, what we were doing was crafting a, 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 a use that was so specific to one that it was, uh, you know, whether, whether, in fact, this, you, the, the, this attempt to get this specific was an attempt to effectively spot zone the property. But we haven't restricted this like the last time, which was going to be specifically for the administrative office of a home health agency. <clears throat> this right. is, we're not restricting it to dentists. It's, it could be any professional office. So I, I don't think that we are, be, we're not, we don't have to craft it quite as specifically that's as right. the last one. That's true. that's true. And I think that, I think that we have to keep in mind that we know that the regulatory body believed that this this conditional use or this use of having dentists, doctors uh, in this specific location was okay. And what we, are, what we have to recognize today and what I think everyone has recognized is that the practice of all those professionals has changed. The rules have changed. Privacy is more enforced. At any given time, you could have an insurance inspector come in and confirm that you're not violating some privacy law. And this is, in, in, in order to support the continued availability to have these kind of practices near residential locations or in, you know, maybe I'm not saying this right, but I think what we're, consi what we're considering here is that these things have changed since zoning code. And it's gonna, it's gonna impact. And I think that's what we're taking into consideration. Yeah, the last thing I wanna do though is to, is to, to, to get a general policy kind of concept oh, that's right. in, 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 in this decision. And, and yeah. I don't want to imply that anybody can come in and, and look to expand their dental use or whatever because, you know, we've, we've you know, talked about that in our decision here. I, I don't think it has anything to do. I, I really, we really need to, to, to make it specific to this site. And we need well, to I think, Susan, that was your clear. point about the, the what is it about this site right. that is that's uniquely... Was, I'm trying to get a sense of what that is, and that's what I was saying before, is that you know, we need to make it clear right. that we know why we're approving this site, and then we can throw all sorts of conditions on or, or what have you. And I was trying to go, I was trying to reach that before and going the wrong way, I obviously. Apologize. But, but, well, well, no, no, but I apologize. Okay. But I, I get you your made point a good now. point. Right. 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 But it, does, doesn't it have to do with its physical location on a county road? Uh, it is in proximity to to this parking. It's not in the center of the zone. I mean, there's there's factors regarding the physical location of this particular lot that m makes it particularly suitable. And I don't think it's Susan. You want to chime in on? I mean, maybe fill in any maybe, gaps that Mr. Keller left open. I mean, is there anything that you can see that? I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but well, I I'm. I appreciate the comments of the board and the applicant. Um, I'm just trying to, the particular suitability, you know, there are a lot of parcels along South Orange Avenue. That's right. Okay, so South Orange Avenue, frontage along South Orange Avenue doesn't necessarily make this site particularly well suited. Right. Now there may be other circumstances that would, but I wouldn't say that that does and I wouldn't say necessarily, I understand the dilemma here with this particular use and right. what is existing and what is being requested. Um, and I also understand the dilemma of trying to limit it. So I think right. that part of it, it has to do with what Patrick believes legally, you know, how much you can, you can do that. Right. Um, but the physical, you know, well, you, could, yeah. you could argue, I could argue on both ends of certain things, but I wouldn't say that the, the location along South Orange Avenue no. is. You, you could argue the site it definitely defends the, the, the granting of the variance related to parking. I think that makes sense with the C variance. But the, um, I mean, does the, does the argument that the use has been there for 60 years um, and that the, and that the, 
the, the, the standard for that use. I mean, that kind of bleeds into so many different properties. I mean, that's. And that's what I was going questioning Mr. Keller about that because the, the dental office would be and has been a, a per permitted conditional use because it was with a residence. Any of those along there could be that, mm. okay? So that in itself doesn't necessarily provide that particular suitability as such. Whether it's been there that long and certain circumstances have changed, that's, that's where the board has to make that evaluation. So s some of what you've said, you know, they're have to evaluate that. And Patrick, I think there's certain legal considerations that Yeah, I'm not have. that concerned about the spot zoning argument, although I understand Michael's point. I think there's, you know, the lot itself is fairly limited and, and, and it could be argued every use variance is spot, is spot zoning. And I think that they, I think the board yeah, has considered what would appear to be reasonable conditions, which were two professionals, two paraprofessionals, no more than eight total. And I think, was there a motion, Mr. Chairman? No. Not yet. And hours of operation were going to be what? Eight, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Um, if I may make a suggestion, because this is a rather difficult resolution to craft, that, that the board may want, if they're inclined, to ask Mr. Dwyer to try to craft a, either a favorable resolution with conditions or whatever, so that then you can look at it and evaluate it and then it's just discuss another option. I think that's a good idea. I, I, I think it's a very good idea because I think this is more than just a list of conditions. Um, oh yeah. There's a lot, there is a lot to think about here. And, and I think we, if what we're attempting to do, which I do think is different than we did last time, I think you're right, this is not where we were last time, which started to feel a lot like spot zoning. Um, making this about professional office use eliminates that. But then I think we really want to think through the implications of that um, and, um, and, and get ourselves comfortable that the conditions give us the, give us the future protections we want. I also think, though, that, that this issue of particular suitability, we need to say something about that. Um, and and um, I... You know, there's a, there's a little something there. It may be interesting to see it in writing. You know, there's something about the proximity to the schools. Uh, there's something about the uh, existing practice and a large client base and, and maintaining, you know, that this, this, maybe there's something there. Um, <coughs> but, I, but I'm really struggling on a solid argument about, about particular suitability of the site. I think what we can consider is having a, a motion to approve or disapprove this application. And if we're going to approve it, uh, Ed, microphone. I'm sorry. Vote to approve the application pending the resolution to be drafted by, by our attorney. I think to leave tonight and not vote up and down or vote whether the client is going to get a resolution in his favor or not, I think it's not fair to the. Well, I, I, I wouldn't be comfortable voting um, without knowing what's in the resolution. But I would be. But I, but I do think if, if it was, it would have to be the sentiment of the board that we're inclined to approve this, okay. assuming that we can find a way to draft a resolution that we believe um, uh, is legally sustainable and, just do that. and that and that addresses our concerns. And and some of those concerns are particular suitability. And the other is that we can restrict the use sufficiently within the category of professionals that we're comfortable with the parking load going forward. And, and the only reason I'm saying that is so that when we get a draft from our attorney, 
we, we, we are either in or out. Right, right. So that's all I'm that's. What, what are examples of particular suitability? Like, for example, if it had a huge yard, large, uh, here we go, yard, yard <laughs> and there was lots of parking, that might make it particularly suitable. I mean, what is a good example? That's a good, of, that's a good example, right? So the, the lot, it's an oversized lot which can easily handle the load without you know, spilling well, while the lots around it are smaller, but this one's a double-sized lot, and therefore it could sustain it. Right? That would be an example. Or maybe that, that while well, it's in a residential zone, there's no residence close to it. Right, right. I mean, here there's a residence four feet away. So, or four feet away, or at least the driveway. Oh, that's Thank true. That yeah. It's not, it, it's, 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 uh, it's point of access doesn't, impact the residential neighbors, in other words. So that might make it particularly suitable. That's right, the corner, the, the fact that it's on a corner could play into suitability. Oh, and, the, and the fact that, the, that where the access point is, is adjacent to a more commercial use versus the residential might make it particularly suitable. South Orange Avenue on that side is still in the residential it's zone. It's still a residential zone, and you know, the other consideration too is the, um, Moving forward, the, the parking lot, even though the access isn't on Elm Court, it's on South Orange Avenue, but the restriction of, the, of that little parking lot there, the size of it and the narrowness of it, and the fact yeah. that you're backing out, you're backing out onto yeah. you know, county, county Road with approximately, I think it's somewhere around 16,000 vehicles average daily traffic a day, as opposed to Elm Court, which is you know, very few. Um, so again, you know, th those are all of the considerations that the, you know, when you look at a site that's particularly suited for a use that's not permitted in the zone, those are a, a lot of the things that you have to take a look at. Can we take into consideration the fact that it's immediately adjacent to a high population area or a, uh, a place where a lot of people work? But it, no. the, again, it's, and, and Mr. A Keller made a are. point about this is the, to the extent that South Orange Avenue versus say a, a lot on Elm Court, mm -hmm. that, so South Orange Avenue, the point being though is that there are a number of lots along that, South Orange Avenue. That we risk looping into this. So it's not just this lot that's fronting on South Orange Avenue that's in, that has these limitations that, that are in this zone. So that's where it's, okay, eliminate all the other lots that could have these uses. How is this along South Orange Avenue um, distinct as such, okay? That's, that's where it's, you know, you, you should look at that in relationship to that. Um, is it adjacent to certain population areas, certain residential areas? Yes, but other lots along South Orange Avenue are as well. And some may be better suited for this kind of a use. Well, yes, I, it uh, talks particular suitability. Yeah. It's not that it has to be no. more suitable. It okay. just needs to be particularly, particularly suitable. well suited, right. not if you don't start to evaluate okay. the level of suitability as such. Okay. So maybe what we should do is, should we get a sense of the board? Because we should, yeah, yeah, we, we, should give we shouldn't give Pat the Lord some direction. I can write a resolution that supports whatever the vote is, but I don't know what the vote is. <laughs> Let's see. So, so if we propose a resolution, then we, we're talking about having the shed removed putting in the handicapped parking and accessibility, acknowledging that it's four spaces and not six. Is that what we said? Yeah. Having well, two. those are just things that I put out there. Those I are mean, just I conditions. They're fine. They're, they're really not the subject of this, of the yeah. concern. It's but I, I mean, I, I'm sort of of Mr. Semper's feeling I'd like to take a vote tonight because we always have the ability to review the resolution before we, before we right. memorialize it. Oh, no, but the vote's been made. So we memorialize a granting resolution we can edit it, but we can't change it to the opposite resolution. No, no, of right. course not. Right. But well, so I think that, that, that yeah, but I'm not. I'm not comfortable. I, I, I am. 
I'm comfortable saying that I'm inclined, if we can find a way to approve this that has solid ground, which to me is about particular suitability and, and is about, is, is it, I guess really it's, a, it's about particular suitability and then it's about this, the, this limitation on the use by counting the number of, that if we can do those two things well and solidly, I am comfortable with the application, right? But if you ask me to vote now, I don't know, I, I'm, not, I'm not yet certain that we can find, that we have yet found solid ground on particular suitability. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you know, there aren't grounds that were in the record. There are, Mr. Keller testified to them. That's right. And, 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 and what you would do is pull them together what he said was, in his testimony, what there were, that it was well suited because there's a high volume of traffic on South Orange Avenue, because it provides yep. easy access for SHU students, because there's adequate parking, because there's prior use at this location, because it would bring, help bring the practice to current HIPAA standards, that it would be a better aesthetic, and that restoring and building the HPC zone is a good idea. And then he said, if it's not approved, it could possibly fall into disrepair, which I wasn't so sure about that one. Yeah, well, that's... And then uh, the board has also said that there are no residents. I think he said there's no residential use in the front to effect and that there's it's on a corner, so there's less residential impact than if it was mid-block. That's what he's told us for the reasons of better, that it was pr particularly well-suited. Well, you know, it's Whether interesting. Whether the board agrees is up to the board. It's it, it, cumul cumul yeah, cumulatively, it's getting late, I guess, but... Um, um, I, it might make sense to 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 vote in favor uh, based on all of those elements, um, whereas any one of them alone would not would not stand, and that could protect us from um, in the future. You know, having having applicants try to tell us, "Well, you've approved something because you know the, the modern day dentistry is different." I mean, I, I would hate to approve something based on that alone, mm -hmm. um, but maybe in combination with the other elements, it does make it unique and therefore um, it wouldn't you know, open us up to having to <coughs> approve everything that came down the pipe. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that I, I would not feel comfortable approving the application for any one or two reason, but only for all of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, absolutely. And, and I want to put it on the record that as much as I now want to go to this dentist, <laughs> I do believe that he should be in town is definitely not why I would vote positively on this application. It is based on all the other content in the application itself. You know, you it's, can never go to this dentist, right? No? No, not if we approve it. Well, I go to the doctor, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Vlad, or Vladinsky, how do you say his name? All right, let's stay focused. It's getting late. So, I don't know how to say his name. He's a nice guy. Though. So, yeah. So is the board's... Uh, pleasure to let Mr. Dwyer put together a draft and then we discuss it at the next meeting and vote then? I, well, okay, because I'm, I'm still thinking about it. I, if, 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 if Dr. Rosamond would be there forever, I definitely think yes. Um, and I'm also thinking what if something happens and he's not there next month? and some other dentist is there, or some other practitioner is there, or some other dermatologist is there, and that's what I have to think of, and that's what concerns me. That's well, um, where the conditions it, come in. Well, well it, it wouldn't be yeah, limited yeah. to doctors either, and, uh, as discussed, no, it could be, it could be any profession. It could be a lawyer there. A lawyer. No offense, Patrick. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> you know, because who knows what's tomorrow's going to bring? Exactly. I think that we have an opportunity to look at this particular matter, and I think we should look at this particular matter. Your sound I think, off. Your sound's off. I, I, I think um, we have an opportunity to look at this particular matter, and we should look at this particular matter, and I think that we have gone <clears throat> backward and forward, and I also think that to come back and, and vote on it um, based on what Patrick writes. It's, 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 it's kind of incredible. We know where we are, let's see where we are, and based on where we are, if, it's a, if we think this is something we like to go forward, 
and we do an up and dump in our Patrick right there based on this. Well, could we, could we vote on one tonight? And if it, if it fails, could we propose another one another day? Applicant can come back. I'm we not can't. sure I understand the question. So if we propose one resolution with a certain specific set of conditions and it fails, would we then be able to have someone propose a separate resolution with different conditions next next time? Mm, no, you could next do it time all at one time. You could do it all at one night. Okay. No, but I'm saying if it you if it's the position of the board that they want that that they may or may not be certain whether or not they would approve or deny based on certain conditions tonight, you know, maybe they think of different conditions they want next week or well, we're here next week. No, we, Procedurally, only, we can't do it. Be, it's only tonight. Only one vote. Okay. Um, and it's well, not a fun. I, I have to tell you that I really, I had, I would have a very hard time trying to draft a resolution based on what I think the application should, should, right. should be up or down because that's I don't get a vote. Mm -hmm. You guys have to tell me how the resolution mm -hmm. should, should, yeah. should go. All right. So why don't I put forward a, a, a resolution? Go ahead. A motion, a motion. Um, and I'll require some help with regard to conditions. But the um, um, I'm going to move to approve um, this application um, with the conditions set forth uh, just a few moments ago uh, with regard to uh, four parking spaces, um, two professionals, and two paraprofessionals uh, maximum um, hours of operation between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. Whatever I'm forgetting. Monday through Saturday. Monday. The total Monday now. through eight Friday. Total, eight total. Monday through Friday, I would say, for the hours of operation. And, and actually, since I'm putting this together, the um, I, I don't recall what he, what time he said he had uh, appointments to on Saturday, but um, he said 12:30. Right. So limited from 8 to 12:30 on Saturday. And then. Um, you know, for the for the, the reasons of particular suitability that were set forth um, by the applicant's planner, uh, which in, in in whole, not in any individual, um, you know, cumulative, cumulatively they, they they stand together. Um, and then um, the with regard to the the parking requirement, um, I believe that it fulfills that C1 variance. Uh, the uniqueness of the property itself, it cannot really physically, you know, contain any additional parking. That's do we want to, do, do we want to, eight, eight total employees. Total employees. oh, the eight total employees, thank you. I know. Including, so, including the professional and the paraprofessional. Right, to total. And is it four spaces on site or yes. is there three, if Sal said I thought there could only be three if one's handicapped? Did you mention uh, Well, no, practically speaking, there's really only it's his two, two spaces on site um, because of the configuration of the driveway that's there now. Right, and and it well, it, it so okay. Parking in tandem. I mean, I don't know if it's parking in tandem should be allowed. Wouldn't you think? You know, should be allowed. Right. It, 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 we well, we allow yeah. parking in tandem on whether or not it should be allowed or not is <laughs> the, not ordinance, allowed. the ordinance. The ordinance. You know, That's not clearly, allowed. Okay. You know, clearly makes you know that there's, there there needs to be a drive aisle. There needs to be an access to okay. you know, in order to have the parking space or so two, the two front ends. Of two parking spaces, one of which is a handicapped space. Well, uh, I, I, you know, again, the reality is you can probably fit four vehicles in this driveway and not be closer to the street than the front of the building. Um, but uh, a, a handicapped parking space should be designated. Right, so we'll say four spaces, one of which is a designated I handicap. Wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I would say a handicap spot, and I that's would, it. A handicap right? parking space you know, should be designated. A legal handicap parking space should be designated on, in the parking. So what am I saying? I'm sorry. Not four spaces, or you're saying just to mention the handicap? Based on what was submitted, you can't really identify four spaces. So okay. I, I think the, the concern So we should is just say that, that we're the handicap space right, that a handicap space will be created. The handicap parking space will be created in the existing driveway. Um, Rich, you want to? 
Yeah, that's I think we could fit, we could still fit two employee only parking spaces head on and fit a, a handicap behind that. Behind it. With, with aisles, so you'd be three total on site. Three total. Okay. okay. And so we'll say that, three total, one designated handicap. Do we want to say anything about loading or garbage disposal or anything like that? Okay. We want to also Ooh, have handicap to access to the first floor. Oh, oh gosh, yes. The hand, and the handicap ramp access to the first floor via the front door. What about the shed? Do you care about the shed? I don't care about the shed. Okay. Fence? Um, are we talking about adding a fence or? Yeah. I don't, okay. I don't. That's, that's, since I put the forward, that motion, okay. that's, that's a mouthful anyway. Right. Oh, excuse me, what was the, it was two professionals, the limit of uh, the people that could be there? Two oh. professionals, two paraprofessionals, and a total of eight, including those four. Right. If you want, we can have um, Patrick read it back to us since if he got it down, uh, the, the whole motion. Okay. Sure. Um, two professionals, two paraprofessionals, and or technicians, no more than a total of eight employees, including the professionals and paraprofessionals. Hours of operation, Monday through Friday, 8 to 9, Saturday, 8 to 1230. Uh, Parking variance uh, with only two employee only spaces and one handicapped space on site. Uh, handicapped access to the first floor and some reasons for particular suitability. Which you're going to take from Mr. Which Keller's you're going to take testimony. from Mr. Keller's testimony, which you read just a few minutes ago. Right. So that's the motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second, Mr. Semper seconded. And Mr. Don? Yes. Mrs. Descalo? Yes. Mr. Palatano? Give me a minute. He said, give me a minute. Uh, Mr. Semper? Yes. Mr. Allen? Give me a minute. Ms. Whirling? Yes. Yes. You guys can safely say no at this point. <laughs> so, so it passes, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, so I will vote yes only because I want to be able to review the resolution. Otherwise, I, I would have voted no. Section. I don't understand. You can't review the resolution no. if you vote no? No, because you're not voting to memorialize it. You're not um. allowed to participate in the resolution if you voted against the action taken by the board? Pardon me? You're He's not confirming allowed to what participate you said. in the resolution if you didn't vote with the majority on the underlying action? That, that's true? That's true. Huh. Can he? Well, then I guess I'm voting yes. I'm not, you know. Can they write a dissent? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can write a dissent. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure that that should be a, a stated valid reason for voting in favor of an application that would that a court would look favorably upon. Well, so now what? So you have other reasons that you would vote in favor, of Mr. Adler, besides that. Overall, I would vote no. I guess I'm in the same place. Okay. See no Five reason two. not to vote. So no. uh, I'll vote in the middle. Yeah. So the uh, the motion carries five to two. Um, so I guess we're done. We'll look anxiously for the resolution draft. And there being no further business, we will adjourn the meeting. I thank everybody for coming tonight, and I thank you for your thoughtful deliberations. I think left a computer or a uh, tablet or something here.